Today marks a new season. It's the first game of the 21st century and the beginning of a new era for Major League Baseball. Never has a regular season game been played outside of North America until now. For decades, the Japanese culture has embraced and honored our national pastime. Players from the Babe to the Wizard of Oz have visited Tokyo as goodwill ambassadors. Today, Japan plays gracious host, the world's best players on stage for a worldwide audience. Last season, the Mets got oh so close, and this season, Mike Piazza looks to lead his team to that elusive pennant. The Cubs have new hope this year with skipper Don Baylor and the world's most popular player, Sammy Sosa. Today on Fox Sports Net, we begin a long journey that will end with the World Series on Fox. in Tokyo, Japan, the venue for the opening of Major League Baseball 2000. This historical series marks the first time in Major League history that regular season games have been played outside of North America. Here come the Mets in Tokyo. Mike Hampton will get the ball. In the New York season opener, let's take a look at Don Baylor's Chicago Cubs starting lineup. It'll be Eric Young, recently acquired from the Dodgers, leading off at second. Damon Buford in center field, and Mark Grace is at first. In right field, the amazing Sammy Sosa, 129 home runs the last two years, zero home run crowns in the National League. Henry Rodriguez in left field. Shane Andrews is at third base. Jose Nieves gets a nod at short. Longtime Yankee Joe Girardi has returned to the Cub where he originally started. And John Lieber will start opening day. And the man they face, he is something. Mike Campton. Oh, he's a real competitor out there on the mound. Came over from the Houston Astros. He's definitely a ground ball pitcher. Average almost two and a half ground balls for every fly ball. Throws a sinker and a cut fastball to right-handers. Will mix in a legitimate curveball to the left-handed hitters. As I mentioned, a very, very competitive pitcher out there on the mound. Let's take it the Mets defensively. Certainly a big question mark is Todd Zeal taking over for John Olerud. His last start at first base came with Philadelphia in 1996. No problems everywhere else. Terrific second baseman in Edgardo Alfonso. The shortstop, his double playmate, is Ray Ordonez. Ordonez, three consecutive gold gloves, and of course flanking him is Robin Ventura, who's won six gold gloves. I'm not sure there's anybody flashier than Ray Ordonez at shortstop. Just a marvelous defender. In the outfield, 41-year-old Ricky Henderson. We'll talk a great deal about him tonight. There have been trade rumors involving Henderson in center field. Solid, not spectacular. It's Daryl Hamilton. And in right, also coming over from the Houston Astros, Derek Bell. Eric Young just joined the Cubs during the offseason, coming over from the Dodgers, along with Ismael Valdez, Terry Adams, and a number of minor leaguers going from the Cubs to the Dodgers. Talk about history in the making. The very first pitch delivered by Mike Hampton will immediately be taken out of play, and that ball will make its way to Cooperstown, New York, in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, what a moment for Mike Hampton. What a moment for Major League Baseball opening the 2000 season in the Tokyo Dome in Japan. Has to be a big thrill for the youngster out there on the mound, Mike Hampton. 22 game winner a season ago with the Astros, a runner up to Randy Johnson in the National League Cy Young Award. The first pitch of the new millennium, a strike. And the ball is off to baseball immortality. Cooperstown, New York, and the Baseball Hall of Fame. I wonder if baseballs get jet lag flying back to the States <laughs> all the way to Cooperstown. 0 oh, 1, Derek Young. 
Yeah. And he looks at a pitch a little bit low. Young, a 281 batter in 119 games a season ago with the Dodgers. He stole 51 bases. Well, it is great to have you with us. I know those of you back in New York, it's 5 o'clock in Chicago. It's 4 o'clock. And 2 a.m. on the West Coast. Two balls and a strike to Young. Bobby Valentine getting an up-close and personal look at arguably the second biggest acquisition during the offseason, second only to perhaps Ken Griffey Jr. returning to his hometown to play for the Cincinnati Reds. Well, Hampton would definitely be a welcome addition to this Mets pitching staff, not only for the numbers that you saw earlier, if he's able to duplicate those, but his attitude uh, should filter through the entire pitching staff. And that one's outside. So Young draws a leadoff walk. And Don Baylor told us before the ball game that Young always has the green light. Yeah, the only player on this Cubs uh, opening day roster that does have the green light anytime he reaches base. And Don Baylor also told us that even though he doesn't have a great deal of team speed, that's a lot of very intelligent base runners, plans to use a lot of hitting and running, get runners in motion, get the players involved in the flow of the game rather than just wait back for the long ball. Now the batter Damon Buford came over from the Boston Red Sox and he looks at ball one outside. Buford only appeared in 91 games a season ago. Hit 242 for the Red Sox, six home runs and 38 batted in. Very odd style of holding a runner on base. Not because it's Todd Zeal, that's just the way the Mets do it. And they do it with left-handed pitchers on the mound more so than right-handers, but in Todd Zeal's case, uh, playing a new position, an odd way of holding the runners on base. You can see him out there near the cut of the artificial turf. We saw him in the exhibition game last night against the Tokyo Giants. A little confusion over there at first base, but those are learning pains that Todd Zeal, I'm sure, will have over there at first base. 1-1 one, one Young running, throw by Piazza, a beauty, but not in time. It was a little high. And that throws down near the bag. Perhaps they get Young, but quickly a leadoff walk for Young and a stolen base. A lot of hard work this spring training for Mike Piazza working with John Bad Dude Stearns on the coaching staff of the Mets this year trying to correct some flaws in his footwork also his arm angle on his throws to second and as you said Tom if that throw was down on the bag they had a pretty good chance to get Eric Young at second base. That's one thing you have to respect about Mike Piazza and many of the major leaguers. Mike Piazza could very easily rest on his laurels, be considered an offensive catcher only, but he wants to improve himself defensively behind the plate. As I mentioned, put in a lot of hard work this spring. Let's see if they ask Buford to get that runner over to third base. One two pitch and he fouls it back off Piazza shin guard. It remains a ball and two strikes. Little things, little things. Baylor talked about it at length before the game today. He knows his team is thin, as you mentioned in the outset. They have so many injuries to key guys on the bench. Not a lot of depth there right now. Willie Green is hurt, his top left-handed pinch hitter, his top outfielder off the bench. Glenn Allen Hill is hurt. So they have to execute when they get their chances. Still one and two to Buford. And you mentioned the little things, Tom, and we've talked about this in the past. Those little things over the course of a 162-game season become big things. Well, you don't have to tell anybody that more than the Mets. Had they won one more game during the first 162, they don't have to play an additional game to advance onto the playoffs and face Arizona. This time away, two and two on Buford. Well, we have had a wonderful time the last few days in Tokyo, a, a marvelous country, a wonderful culture, and they love their baseball. Very knowledgeable baseball fans. They understand how the game works. They anticipate Damon Buford trying to move the ball to the right side of the field right here. Buford continues to foul the ball off, appearing to be pulling it to the left side. This is another one of those little things we talked about a moment ago. Buford has to try to advance Eric Young to third base with one out. Give Mark Grace and Sammy Sosa an opportunity. Even with two strikes, Damon Buford handles the bat well enough that he should be trying to push that ball to the right side. Jeff Pentland, the hitting coach for the Chicago Cubs, I'm sure will drill that into some of these players that they're not going to be able to wait for the long ball this year. And he shoots it into right field. It'll fall for a hit. They'll wave around. Feet. 
inning. Two batters in a run for Chicago, the first run of the new millennium. Nice piece of hitting by Damon Buford, just punching that ball out into the right field corner. A strong throw by Derek Bell on a hop to Mike Piazza, but as you see, up the line just far enough to give Eric Young room to get in behind Mike Piazza. As you mentioned at the top of the show, Derek Bell, somewhat of a question mark out there in right field. At times, will show flashes of brilliance. At other times, seems a little lost out there defensively, but a nice throw that time, just a couple of feet too far up the line. And that ball also will make its way to the Baseball Hall of Fame. The first hit in the year 2000, the first run in the year 2000. So bone up, fans. I know it's early in the morning back <laughs> in the States, but that'll be a good trivia question. Well, obviously, his internal time clock has not made the change yet. Mark Grace making his 12th straight opening day start at first base for the Cubs. And he gets hit in the back. So a rough beginning in the New York Met career for Mike Hampton. He's not retired a batter. He just seems to be having a little trouble out there on the mound, finding a release point. I mean, very rarely will you see Mike Hampton throw a ball that far inside to a left-handed hitter. He loves to work both sides of the plate, but that would appear to get away from him a little bit. Some of the pitchers over here during the exhibition games have complained about the mound. The dirt seems to be very loose out there, hard to get footing. It's not a typical clay dirt mix like the players are used to pitching off of in the United States. Well, here's a man that many have paid just to come and watch here tonight. Slamming Sammy Sosa. Not only do they love the way he plays the game, but he has embraced not only America, not only Japan, but the world with his personality. He's down a strike. That looked like McGuire's swing right around 61 with all the flash bulbs in the seats. Uh, Sam, he put on quite a show in batting practice in the exhibition games as well as this afternoon before this ball game, hitting balls off the roof of the stadium way out there in left field. Oohs and ahs from the fans here in Tokyo. Sosa up there with two on and nobody out. One nothing Chicago here in the opening inning. And the 0-1. Strike called on the outside corner. Sosa has had his problems with Mike Hampton through the years. Nice pitch right here from Hampton. He seems to be able to get the ball down in the strike zone a little better. Sammy Sosa will do that to a pitcher. He'll either bring out the best or bring out the worst. And Mike Hampton is not a guy that's afraid of a challenge. And as you mentioned, he's had his way with Sammy Sosa. 0 oh, 2 pitch. Fastball up, hoping Sammy would chase it. He didn't. Now, Sammy will chase that high fastball up above the letters from time to time. Definitely a low ball hitter. Most pitchers try to get ahead of Sammy and then lead him out of the strike zone, either with bad breaking balls or fastballs up high out of the zone. Two on, none out. And a 1 2 pitch to Sosa on the ground should be two or don't you? After losing Mark Grace to a hit by pitch, Hampton found his rhythm, a good fastball down low. Sammy fouled it off the called strike on the outside corner. This is where Mike Hampton can play around a little bit, goes up high. Sammy does not chase, but then gets the breaking ball, grounds it to Ray Ordonez, and that's all she wrote. That's not where you want to hit a ground ball. Boy, this Mets infield defense. Todd Zeal accepted at this point, but the other three guys as good as it gets. Henry Rodriguez a big swing and a miss. Rodriguez last season missed the final month by and large with a pained back. 26 home runs 87 batted in. Oh the memories for these fans in the seats. Nearly an impossible ticket to get. Rodriguez lifts one into center field. It should end the inning and will. Cubs touch up Hampton for a run on a hit. Piazza the cleanup hitter with the Mets back in the last of the first. Come back to the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan. The Cubs have taken a 1-0 lead and now John Lieber will face his lineup. Scribble down by Bobby Valentine. Ricky Henderson leads off in left. Daryl Hamilton in center. Edgardo Alfonso is at second base. Mike Piazza, 40 home runs a season ago. He's a cleanup hitter.
Robin Ventura is at third base. Derek Bell. Big, big key for this Mets team this season. He's in right. Todd Zeal at first. Ray Ordonez at short. And Mike Hampton on the mound. They're facing John Lieber. John, John Lieber, 30-year-old out of Council Bluffs, Iowa. Will turn 30 in a couple days, rather. Tough on right-handers. He struggles against lefties. He's a sinker ball slider pitcher. Is working on a changeup to try to get the left-handed hitters out. Does not waste pitches. Likes to go right after the hitters. You can see that changeup must change. That's a pitch that he started working on this spring in order to try to get out left-handed hitters. The defense behind him for Chicago. Andrews, Nieves, Young, and the amazing Mark Grace over at first base, a four-time Gold Glove winner in the National League. Rodriguez, Buford, solid defensively in center, Sosa in right, and Joe Girardi, originally a Cub, went on to Colorado, won three World Series rings with the Yanks, and now catches John Lieber. Uh, Joe Girardi is the next best thing to having a manager catch the game for you. Very knowledgeable handling the pitchers. He knows how the game is supposed to be run. Ricky Henderson swings at the first pitch. Pops it up down the left field line. And Rodriguez straddling the line makes a catch. So Lieber one pitch one out. You mentioned he doesn't fool around with guys. Uh, even when he gets ahead in the count he's likely to throw the ball over the plate. He averaged less than three and a half pitches per batter last year. He likes to get the ball throw it over the plate let his defense work behind him. Nice job of communication there by the Cubs left side of the defense. Shane Andrews appeared to have a beat on it at first. He was called off by Jose Nieves who was called off by Henry Rodriguez. That's the way it's supposed to be done. Fundamental baseball. Darrell Hamilton looks at a fastball low and away. Hamilton appeared in 55 games for the Mets last year. The first half of the season with Colorado hit 339. He looks at a strike. Hamilton surprising power last season. Granted the first half better than the first half with the Rockies in the mile high air. Good play by Lieber back on the mound. Quickly two gone. Hamilton's been nursing an injured toe and an injured knee. He fell down coming out of the box and he's limping a little bit. Now we've seen a couple of batters slip coming out of the batter's box. Very similar dirt behind home plate. Not a lot of clay. See Lieber with that hard sinker ball going down and most sinker ball pitchers are good defensive fielders out there on the mound. They know they're going to get their share of comebackers. John Lieber no exception. Looks like there's some grass growing in that batter's box. That's not what you want, is it? Now, this is an AstroTurf field. I don't get it. <laughs> well, that's probably left from Florida spring training. It was stuck in his cleats from Florida. Might have been. Edgardo Alfonso takes a fastball high. A marvelous year for the native Venezuelan last season. You see the 27 home runs, 108 runs batted in. He hammers one into left center field. So on his way to second he had 41 of those as well last year. Well, a lot of baseball people uh, myself included feel that you have not seen the best of Edgardo Alfonso a marvelous season last year but this is a player who is only going to get better with age. Well, here's another guy that continues to get better and better with age Mike Piazza. 40 home runs, 124 knocked in last season for the Mets. And normally you would anticipate a pitcher pitching to Piazza very carefully in this situation with first base open, but we mentioned Lieber has problems with lefties. Robin Ventura is a left-handed hitter waiting in that on deck circle. So you go after Piazza? Well, that's Lieber's M.O. He goes after every hitter, unless the situation absolutely screams to pitch around a hitter. He's going to throw the ball over the plate, try to get the batter to put it in play weakly. strike. You certainly think if Lieber's going to make mistakes against Mike Piazza they will be pitchers mistakes. If you try to hit the outside corner miss further away from the hitter. If you try to go down around the knees miss further low. Don't miss over the heart of the plate or you may not get the baseball back. Oscar Acosta the pitching coach high bouncer over to third base. Andrews has it and the inning is over an impressive opening inning for John Lieber. One hit, one left. The Cubs lead at the end of one. One nothing. 
Sportsnet is brought to you by Fram, who asks, when was the last time you changed your air filter? The Tokyo Dome. Sellout crowd, not only tonight, but again tomorrow night when these two teams conclude this historical season opening series. Hot dogs, get your hot dogs. Oh, that, no, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Doesn't look like a hot dog to me. No, I don't know what it is, but it looks pretty good. Although you can get hot dogs here at the ballpark. But take a look. You better bring your wallet. Hot dog will cost you three dollars and eighty cents. We're doing the conversion for you. I know it's early. Shrimp tempura, Bobby. You were dining on that a day or two ago. Eight fifty. And the sushi platter, eighteen dollars. Well, a lot of people love that sushi. They have young ladies carry kegs of beer up and down the aisles here at the Tokyo Dome. Not a bad thing at all. And you can't miss them. They wear that that neon green and orange. Uh, you can see the vendors everywhere in this ballpark. You don't have to look for one. We begin the second inning. Shane Andrews. See his numbers last year. Released by the Exabos, picked up by the Cubs. He did hit five home runs in 19 games, and they liked what they saw. They figured, why not give him a chance to come back? Don Baylor's team a 1 0 lead here in the second. And now three balls and no strikes. It'll be interesting to see how Mike Hampton works with his new battery mate, Mike Piazza, behind the plate. Piazza has been criticized in the past for his lack of skill behind the plate. I mentioned worked very hard this spring on improving that aspect of his game. We asked Mike Hampton about working with his new battery mate this spring. You know, I think we've been working actually pretty well together this spring, uh, and I think we'll only get better. Uh, you know, you hear about how great he is offensively, and uh, he's a hazard defensively, you know, it's going to be tough. To, uh, and there's no, you don't see that at all. He actually, he is, he's actually a good catch. Well, Mike Hampton, 25 pitches already in this ball game. Neither pitcher on any kind of a pitch count at this point. Spring training is over, boys and girls. This is the real deal. But 25, now 26 pitches through the early going of this game. That's a high total for Mike Hampton. And it's been an atypical Mike Hampton through the first inning plus you mentioned the high pitch count he has walked to he's hit a batter and allowed a run. Jose Nieva is a late addition to the Cubs starting lineup. He takes a fastball high one and one. Ricky Gutierrez was originally in the starting lineup at shortstop but then came down with a strained left rib cage muscle. Damon Buford moved from seven in the lineup up to the two hole. The Avis gets an odd at shortstop. And Damon Buford gets the first hit in the year 2000. How about that? The stars are aligned on the ground. Ordonez will take it himself. Double play second to the game turned by the Mets. Well, that's absolutely a Taylor made double play there. Chopper over the mound. That AstroTurf field, you know the ball's going to get to Ray Ordonez. He fields it, throws on to first base in plenty of time. And once again, Davis slipping as he comes out of the batter's box. Something to keep an eye on as this game goes on. You mentioned we talked to Joe Girardi at length about that dirt around the home plate area as it's strike one to the aforementioned Joe Girardi. Said so by the time he stepped in there for BP, it was about four inches deep. Well, we've all seen sand lots, little league games, high school games, whatever the case may be. Uh, the all dirt fields with no clay to give support. And as the game goes on, those holes get deeper and deeper. It makes it very treacherous for a catcher behind the plate. And it makes it tough for the hitters as well to come out of that batter's box. Two balls and a strike to Joe Girardi, who won three World Series rings in four years with the New York Yankees. Get a look at that area around home plate starting to get chewed up. The lines are disappearing inning by inning. That's not unusual. What is unusual, however, is the depth of those holes as the batters continue to dig in there to get a foothold. 
breaking balls in the dirt be very tough for the catchers to handle and as we've seen several of the hitters have had trouble getting out of the box it seems to be very wet as well 2 2 to Joe Girardi and he chops it foul I don't think there's any holes in the Tokyo Dome I don't believe any of that rain yesterday leaked in here there was plenty of it last night although a beautiful day today Chicago like day today winds upwards of 25 35 miles per hour pitchers win it would have been blowing in had this not been a dome 2 2 delivery full count Girardi originally signed by the Cubs as a fifth round draft choice back in 1986 broke in with the Cubs in 89 and then left after the 92 season to join Don Baylor in Colorado. Ordonez waits and that's that. Hampton takes care of business in the second. We move to the bottom half of the inning. Ventura, Bell, and Zeal coming up. One nothing. We're in Tokyo. Nothing. We go to the bottom half of the second inning. John Stearns, the Mets coach, wearing a microphone for us. Our Fox sounds of the game. Ready. I like those. I like those unis you and Scotty got on. I like it. You held that back from us in spring training, all all spring. You didn't break it out till opening night. I like it. Well, Derek Bell certainly has a uniform wearing style, if you will. Of the Mets medical staff, Fred Hina and Scott Lawrenson. <laughs> Eric Bell has a kimono look with that uniform. Right in the spirit of opening day in Tokyo. Bottom half of the second inning, Mets trailing John Lieber and the Cubs, 1 0. Robin Ventura looks at ball one high and away. Ventura, a monster season for the Mets last year. In fact, the best season. Of what has been an outstanding major league career for Ventura. One and one. Pretty much shoots holes in that theory that it takes a hitter a year to learn the pitchers in a new league. Robin Ventura didn't seem to have much trouble learning the pitchers in the National League last year. Two balls and a strike. It's a tremendous clutch hitter. The, the term is overused in the game nowadays, as far as I'm concerned, but this guy definitely is a gamer. Injured his foot in the very first game of the season last year, played all year, coming off shoulder surgery. Had to take it easy in spring training this year, only was allowed to play defense the last four or five days of the exhibition schedule. But you know he's going to be in there 155, 160, maybe 162 games this year. Two hopper knocked down by Young. And again, a batter falls down coming out of the box. Ventura goes down as he was on his way to first. Towards the Mets third base side dugout. This is not good. Well, if it happens once or twice, maybe you, you attribute it to the batter trying to explode out of that box too quickly. But when every other hitter is slipping coming out of the box, obviously something needs to be done. I wouldn't be surprised if Randy Marsh, the home plate umpire, stops this game or perhaps between innings, calls the grounds crew out there and tries to do something to firm up that dirt around the home plate area. Well, you certainly hope that Ventura is okay. You'd hate to see any player from either team injured because, well, because the home plate area, quite frankly, is not up to major league standards. And as I said, it's quite apparent that it's not just a player or two. Almost every hitter has stumbled or slipped coming out of that batter's box. Ventura, the worst, actually went all the way down to the ground. Time question mark for the New York Mets. He knocked in 108 runs two years ago, really struggled last year. Popped up in a shallow right center, and Young goes out to get it. Two up, two down in the New York second inning. Bell in the last year of his contract, and the Mets are banking that the real Derek Bell was 1998 and not 1999. Well, it remains to be seen. Derek Bell was very close to his former hitting instructor with the Houston Astros, Tom McCraw. Tom 
Lacroix was on the shelf for a while, battling cancer. Harry Spillman came in to take over as a hitting instructor. Derek Bell's numbers went down. He said he missed that relationship he had with Tom McCraw. Working with Tom Robson, the new hitting coach that he has this year with the Mets, it remains to be seen what kind of a relationship the coach and player will develop. Todd Seal has big shoes to fill as well. John Olerud elected to go back to his native land, if you will, the great Northwest, where he grew up in Washington. He signed as a free agent with the Mariners. The Mets did just about everything they could to keep him. But they brought in Seal, and he is a solid player. He puts up consistent numbers every year. A guy like Todd Seal, Eric Karras, another player that comes to mind, you can write down their numbers the first day of spring training. 90 or more RBIs each of the last four years. He's always around 20 to 25 homers. But he comes up empty against Lieber. One, two, three inning. Back at the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, the Cubs lead the Mets 1 0. Chip Carey joined by the Commissioner of Baseball, Bud Seelig. Mr. Commissioner, first of all, congratulations on this historic night in Japan. Your feelings and what you've seen this week? Well, it is historic, Chip. This has been a wonderful week. I, I know that you, you're never quite certain how things are going to come out, but just to be here and watch the passion and the, the interest and uh, it, this is just a wonderful experience. In fact, when I was walking out in the field with uh, Hank Aaron and Don Fair, Hank said to me on the way out, would you have ever believed we'd be here? I mean, it, this is just, it's a great night for baseball. I, I uh, Who would have ever thought we'd, we'd be opening the season in Tokyo and uh, Everything just couldn't have been better all week long. Uh, they, they, they've been wonderful hosts, and um, and I know the teams have enjoyed it. And the internationalization of our sport will continue because this is uh, really the more you're around, you know, this is absolutely the right thing to do. You know, uh, regular opening day, of course, will be April 3rd back in the states. In a thumbnail, can you give us the state of the game for the year 2000 now? Well, you know, we're in the midst, uh, Chip, of a remarkable renaissance. I believe by any objective criteria, the game has never been more popular. We'll set another all-time attendance record. Uh, next week, we're going to open uh, three new ballparks in San Francisco and in Houston and in Detroit. And uh, so uh, the year, I, when you look at the divisions, uh, the races look like they're going to be extremely competitive. Um, I think 2000 is going to be a spectacular year. I, I really, and it's uh, it's a great way to start. There are a lot of issues still confronting the game of baseball. The umpiring situation is going to be new. The possibility of realignment. What concerns you with the game of baseball at this time? Well, you know, in the midst of this renaissance and its great popularity, there's no question about it. a lot of most of these issues. I think we can work our way through. The, clearly, the issue of disparity and the economics of the game are something I spend a great deal of my time on, and. We'll get it done. We have a lot of work to do, and there's no question that there are those problems, and they do exist. And it's paradoxical because here you are in the midst of this tremendous popularity, and uh, but we have some problems that need to be solved, but we will solve them. Hopefully, we can solve that situation at home plate. A little bit tough uh, in the the batter's box at this point. Well, that's, they're having a tough time getting out of it, and uh, they need to work in the dirt a little bit. But enjoy the night. Congratulations. Thank you, Chip. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Tommy. Bobby, back to you. Thank you very much, Chip. Great to have the commissioner with us right here on Fox Sports Net. And certainly a baseball very much basking in the glory of, of this two game series. I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the jet lag. How will the teams be affected when they turn return uh, back to the United States? But this is so great for the international game. One away in the Chicago third. Cubs lead Mike Hampton and the Mets. One nothing. Young drew a walk to begin the game, stole second, and scored on a single to right by Damon Buford. Well, we've got it all for you in Japanese and in English. Can you read that top line? No problem. It's one nothing. <laughs> Brown ball to Ordonia. Two away. I mean, come on, can't you read that? Right across the top. Have you oh, seen the, the very yeah, How about the second line? No problem. One run, one hit, and no errors for Chicago. And a, yeah, 0 1 0 the totals for the Mets. No problem. That's, above them. That's what I'm reading. Oh, sure you are. I'll tell you, it's baffling to me uh, how these people write this language. The, I played winter ball. I've been to the Dominican Republic, I've been to Venezuela. 
I eventually picked up some Spanish, enough to communicate and get by. I'm not so sure if I could stay here long enough to pick up this language, but the people have been so cooperative trying to help that they see the confused look on my face yeah. when I'm out on the streets, and they have been very helpful, pointing us to the right subways, the right trains, the right buses, and uh, it's just been a wonderful experience, but I don't believe I'll ever be able to write or read that. Damon Buford, his father Don, played professionally here in Japan, of course also played Major League Baseball with, among others, the Baltimore Orioles. And there's a strike on the outside corner. Well, this has been a place a lot of American major leaguers have come either to extend their career a couple more years or make some changes. Come over here and work on your game, perhaps learn a new pitch, try to refine some aspect of your game. Foul up the left field line, three and two to Buford. Well, some familiar names and faces have spent time in Japan. Cecil Fielder, the Goose, Goose Gossage, perhaps the best known Hideo Nomo. Banning Jesse Barfield, who also played over here. Well, Cecil Fielder uh, comes to mind immediately. Uh, could not hit a breaking ball in his days with the Toronto Blue Jays. Came over here to Japan, where the pitchers feature a lot of off-speed pitches. Cecil Fielder came back to the States and just tore it up. Yeah. Third walk of the game issued by Mike Hampton. Some of the U.S. stars and what they've done here in Japan. Randy Bass, a triple crown, back-to-back -back years in 85 and 86. A batting average, a Japanese league record. Boomer Wells, and no, that's not David Wells, won four batting titles. Taken high as Buford fakes taking off for second base. And then Lerat and Leon Lee combined for 551 home runs. Not a bad tag team right there. Not bad at all. One and out to Grace. And it's two balls and no strikes. Hampton missing a lot high here in the first three innings. Which is very rare for Mike Hampton. Generally, when he misses the zone or when he misses his spots, they're, they're pitches that are down low out of the strike zone. Hanging a lot of breaking balls up high in the zone. That cut fastball just not able to get it down where he'd like. Three and out of Grace. Saw a moment ago he came over with the Major League All-Stars in their tour of Japan and does what he normally does, and that's just hit. This guy is truly amazing. The all-time hits leader for the 90s. Pitch taken up and in, ball four. Four walks through the first two and two-thirds innings. By Mike Campton and Dave Wallace, a New York pitching coach, will come out and check with his newly acquired ace. We see Mike Hampton digging around out there on the Tokyo Dome Mount. I think the players are uh, a little bothered by the surface, uh, particularly the pitchers and the batters. Hampton racking up a high pitch count already in the ball game. You see there 59 pitches through the early part of this game. and works a lot like John Lieber. They want to get the ball, throw it over the plate, get ahead of the batter, force them to put the ball in play, let the defense work behind him and get back in that dugout and let their batters go to work. Slamming Sammy undoubtedly will reach seven years of 30 or more home runs before this 2000 season is over. The Cubs have given John Lieber a 1-0 lead. They have two on with two out, and Sosa looks at a strike. Sammy bounced into a 6-4-3 double play in the first inning. Not much was made of Don Baylor's comments going into spring training that he wanted to see Sammy be more of a complete player, refine the other parts of his game, his defense, his base running, his base stealing. Not worry so much about just going up there and whirly birding, trying to hit every pitch out of the ballpark. If a pitcher makes a mistake, Sammy Sosa is going to hit it out of the ballpark. Take the singles, take the doubles, get on base, set the table for your teammates. If the guy makes a mistake, eh, go ahead and hit it in the seats. Two on, two out, one nothing Cubs, and the one one to Sosa is down and in. If you weren't with us, Hampton has owned 
and Sosa during their respective careers. The last two seasons, and Sosa has been hitting home run after home run, has not hit a home run the last two years against Mike Hampton. Three balls and a strike and a hitter's count coming up. Rodriguez would be next. He'd like to come up there with the bases empty. 3-1 on the way. And Sosa takes the walk. What if Sammy's such a fun guy to talk to? And we asked Sammy, how would you pitch to yourself? Well, I had to think about it first, you know, because I don't want to make no mistake. <laughs> you know, even myself, even Mark or Griffin, you know, and pretty much, uh, I don't know, I might walk a couple of times. <laughs> I might go out. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy knows about pitching is he likes to whack at it. Hampton has walked the bases loaded and Rodriguez swings at the first pitch and pops it up. That will retire the side. The Cubs lead the bases loaded. We move to the last of the third. One nothing Chicago. One nothing ball game Cubs in front of the Mets and in between innings. Our first international incident, if you will, Mr. Brennan. <laughs> the grounds crew on a serious note getting to work to make sure all is well. well. They're raking away some of the loose dirt, and you can see them pounding the dirt back down, trying to firm up that batter's box, give those hitters a little better footing coming out of the box. Let's go downstairs to Chip Carey. All right, Tom and Bob, thank you very much. The uh, home plate area, quite obviously, is very soft, very sandy. The plan for Major League Baseball right now is to rake and pound the batter's box every half inning. Talking with Eric Young of the Cubs, he said it's very slippery, very dangerous. Baseball's monitoring the situation. Hopefully nobody's going to get hurt. Let's send it back to you upstairs. Well, it shouldn't catch anybody by surprise at this point, and I'm sure that Bobby Valentine for the Mets and Don Baylor for the Cubs has warned his, their hitters as they go to the plate, keep your feet under you coming out of the batter's box. Perhaps you lose a half a step going down that first baseline, but better to lose a half a step here than to lose 14 days on the disabled list when you get back to the States. John Lieber has been terrific through the first two innings. He's allowed one hit. He has struck out a batter, not walked anybody. Strike one to Ray Ordonez. Ordonez, a 258 hitter a season ago, knocked in 60 runs. He hammers that ball off the thumb of Andrews, and it's in the left field, a base hit. Shane Andrews was drawn in several feet in front of the line at third base, and Ray Ordonez just drove that ball right through Shane Andrews. Ordonez really rounding out as a player, was known as strictly a leather man early in his career. As you mentioned, career highs last year offensively, and the Mets are hoping he continues to get better. And this guy can hit. You saw those numbers, Hampton. A 311 batter a season ago. He became the first pitcher to win 20 games and hit at least 300 in the same season since Catfish Hunter. And a perfect butt. Fielded by Girardi, give Hampton a sacrifice, advancing a tying run, Ordonez to second base. See good form by Hampton, gets the bat above the ball to make sure it's going to go down. However, he dropped the barrel of the bat as the ball got into the hitting zone and popped it up. He's very fortunate this ball was not caught. If he had kept the bat level at the top of the strike zone where he had it to begin with and dropped the entire bat down parallel to the ground, he probably would have butted it on the ground, but he dropped the barrel only, causing him to pop the ball up in the air. Tying run is Ray Ordonez at second base, one out. And here comes Ricky Henderson. Henderson on the first pitch in the bottom of the first inning popped up down the left field line to Henry Rodriguez. Take a look at that butt by Mike Hampton. You can see he's got the barrel of the bat up. It's level right there. That's pretty good position right there to put down a sacrifice butt. But as the ball gets into the hitting area, you saw the barrel of the bat drop down underneath the ball. You have to come down with both hands and keep that bat at the angle you want it. 
Anderson looks at a strike one and one to Major League Baseball's all time stolen base leader fifth all time in runs scored third all time in walks a lead pipe cinch first ballot Hall of Fame two balls and a strike 41 years old born on Christmas Day 1958 and he can still get it done. I know you get some argument from baseball people but for my money the greatest leadoff hitter to ever play this game combination of speed power and a little bit of flair. Oh yeah. Drilled in the left field a base hit. Ordonez had to wait to see if the ball would be caught. So he advances only to third. And now the show begins. Ricky Henderson on at first base. He said he wasn't running much in spring training. Didn't run at all in the exhibition games that the Mets played here. As we get a look at Ordonez as he takes his secondary lead off the bag had to wait momentarily to make sure that line drive got through into the outfield before advancing to third base. Mentioned Ricky hasn't been running a lot in spring but watch him tonight. Ricky made a promise during a telecast of the exhibition game two nights ago on Japanese television that uh, he was saving his running for the fans in Japan <laughs> and that starts tonight. <laughs> Daryl Hamilton bounced out to Lieber in the first inning. And it's ball one high and away. To the career steals the record in Japan. Go ahead and try that name, big boy. Yutaka Fukamoto. Very nice. Now Ricky will try to time John Lieber, try to get a, an idea of when he's going to deliver that ball to home plate, and hopefully for Ricky. Get what they call a walking lead. Have some momentum going towards second base. That was almost a disaster for all parties concerned right there. Henderson had come back to the bag. Apparently it asked Angel Hernandez. You see the umpire behind him for timeout. Nobody else knew it, including Lieber, who was already in the pause in his stretch. A 1-0 to Hamilton. In the air ground up the left field line Andrews a long run and he won't get to it. a lot of foul territory here at the Tokyo Dome not only between the bases but down the left and right field lines considerably more foul territory than you'll see in most of the American ballparks a long run for Andrews and Henry Rodriguez no chance to catch up with that little humpback pop up. jam packed Tokyo Dome Tokyo Japan this historical season opening series to begin the new millennium for Major League Baseball and a good ball game. One nothing Chicago last to the third two on one out and the one one to Daryl Hamilton on the way. Again he fights it off and this one will drop out of play so Lieber hoping for the strikeout. Stands full of baseball fans here at the Tokyo Dome as they have been for the exhibition games preceding this Major League Baseball season opener. It's, it's just odd to be in this country and walk down the streets and see people wearing Cubs hats, Mets hats. I saw a Cardinals hat out on the street today, a Diamondbacks hat. They love their baseball. One and two on Hamilton. Henderson sent back to the bag. Lieber, we mentioned very much a strikeout pitcher. 186 of those a season ago, eighth most in the league. There's a young Yankee fan. <laughs> Another cap is seen. One two to Hamilton Henderson running and it's in the air left field. This should bring in the tying run. Ordonez tags. Rodriguez throws and it's not going to be in time. Hamilton the sack fly run batted in one one. Rodriguez made that play closer than I thought it was initially going to be Rodriguez not known for his throwing arm but he got himself in pretty good position was able to move into the ball we'll get a look as Ricky is running on the play Ray Ordonez goes back to tag you can see Rodriguez had his momentum coming toward the plate of course a pretty good throw just too far into foul territory for Joe Girardi to get back and apply a tag well, I'm with you. we haven't seen Rodriguez make that good of a throw in a couple of years well, you don't really have to have a great arm in the outfield if you do things correctly. We talked about Don Baylor and the emphasis on fundamentals this spring. 
outfielders can get themselves in a proper position so that their momentum is carrying them towards their target, it'll make up for a lot of weakness in the arm if you get your body into a good position. 1-1 one, one ball game. Henderson at first, two away. We're in the last of the third inning. And as we said, Ricky was running on that pitch that was flied into left field by Daryl Hamilton, and now with two outs in the inning, I wouldn't be surprised to see Ricky smile first and then try to steal second. One out to Alfonso. He's on the outside corner of strike. A lot of trade rumors involving Henderson, even now. About the possibility of Ricky going to Detroit in exchange for left handed hitting outfielder Bobby Higginson. Higginson had a couple of terrific years and then really slumped last season. It's hard to envision this Mets team with aspirations of the postseason without Ricky Henderson at the top of their lineup. Well, very little speed up and down the lineup other than Ricky Henderson and Daryl Hamilton to a certain extent not an explosive base stealer but you have to have that guy at the leadoff spot to make things happen. A guy like Ricky gets on base he draws the attention of the pitcher fall behind the following hitters perhaps they get a better pitch to hit than they normally would. Swing and Alfonso went too far. Well, Ricky said, if you're going to trade me, do it before we leave for Japan. Right. He said he doesn't <laughs> want to be left over here. <laughs> Go, One ball, two strikes on Edgardo Alfonso. Again, Henderson back standing up. Yeah, you can see Ricky's style. He gets out there very near the end of that dirt strip at round first base, and he'll have both feet together. And then as Lieber goes into his set position, see Ricky's got both feet together right there, waiting for Lieber to go into his set position. And as he does, he's trying to time it and take that last step out there onto the turf, get his momentum moving towards second base to make it easier to steal the bag. And Ricky has always been one of the harder head sliders in the game has done it throughout his career miraculously has avoided major injuries but really accelerates into his head first slide there he goes swing and a miss it doesn't matter but the Mets tie the game RBI sack fly by Daryl Hamilton and the grounds crew will get back to work this will be the story the rest of the night 1-1 as we move to the fourth in Tokyo 1931 and baseball began to reach a fever pitch in this country. Four years later, it prompted the start of the professional Japanese league. Many people believe here it was directly because of Babe Ruth. Well, a tremendous ambassador for the game of baseball in his day, much like Sammy Sosa is for the game of baseball today. I'll tell you what, though, I would have liked to. Uh, Followed Babe Ruth around the streets of Tokyo for a couple days. I bet that was interesting. Whoa. <laughs> wow. Shane Andrews, Jose Nieves, Bill Girardi going for the Cubs against Mike Hampton. The 22 game winner a season ago came over to trade from the Astros. 27 year old native of Crystal River, Florida. He's only allowed one hit, but he has walked five batters in the game. He starts Shane Andrews with a big overhand curveball, a pitch that he's used very sparingly to this point of the game. You see the five walks. He averaged only three per nine innings last year. I'm sure that a certain amount of Mike Hampton's wildness can be attributed to the mound. We talked they're having some problems out on the mound as well as the home plate area, but also maybe a little bit of nerves. I mean, for crying out loud, certainly understand. Fisted into right. It'll fall in a base hit. moment let's go back downstairs to Chip Carey. All right Tommy that agronomy major sure has paid off so far here at the Tokyo Dome. Yeah. I talked with the head's groundskeeper just a few moments ago. He said the dirt on the base pass and at home plate is sufficient for, for a Japanese league ball game but the players were complaining about the status of the mound the base pass and the batter's box. So last night they started adding some clay like they have in the major league stadiums back home. However the groundskeeper said that one day is not sufficient enough for that to really settle in and get very firm so they're going to keep pounding it out and hopefully things will progress nicely the rest of the night. Great.
to have Chip Carey with us here tonight. He'll be handling all the play by play in innings five, six, and seven. Terrific voice of the Chicago Cubs. And he has a very much an interested spectator watching right now back in Chicago. There are many undoubtedly watching in Chicago, but at Harry Carey's restaurant. Outside in Rosemont, Illinois, on the ground, hit and run, done to perfection by Nieves, base hit into right center field. And advancing on to third is Andrews. It's exactly what Don Baylor told us before the ball game. Shane Andrews is not the kind of guy that's going to straight steal a base. But he gets him in motion, it opens a hole on the right side of the field as Edgardo Alfonso broke to cover the bag. Nieves a nice job staying inside the ball and just guiding it through that hole on the right side. Very nearly found that gap. That, of course, would have scored Andrews and been an extra base hit and really set the table for a big inning for the Cubs. And when you don't have a lot of speed in your lineup, rather than sit back and wait for a big inning, I, I agree with Don Baylor. Get the players moving. Get everybody involved. Makes it a little bit easier for that hitter to find a hole in the infield if that runner's on the move. And don't be surprised if something might be happening right here with Joe Girardi at the plate. Uh, Joe Girardi, tremendous handler of the bat, good bunner. Opening day starter, starting catcher for the eighth straight season with three different teams. We mentioned the Yankees earlier, the Colorado Rockies, and now the Chicago Cubs for the second time around. Runners on the corners, nobody out. And Girardi takes high. Two balls, no strikes. And just to finish that thought, Dutchie Carey, the wife of the late great and our dear friend Harry Carey, Chip Carey's grandfather, will be singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game from Harry Carey's restaurant right here on Fox Sports Net come the middle of the seventh. Dutchie, hope you're doing well. What a great lady. Foul back. Two balls and a strike to Girardi. And Joe Girardi had a good hitter's count there, 2-0. And, oh, and Don Baylor's a hitter, first and foremost. He was a tremendous hitter throughout his career, and he realizes that if he's got a hitter at the plate with an advantage against that opposing pitcher, turn him loose. Now you may see a little hit and run, maybe a squeeze play. Who knows? I mentioned Joe Girardi can bunt the ball very well. So the pitcher is on deck. That one in the dirt, and the runner is going to advance. Piazza smothered it, but just couldn't field the ball cleanly. Not that you expect any catcher to field a ball in the dirt cleanly. On to second base goes the Ames. Yeah, we touched on it briefly earlier. The area around home plate that gets dug up. You see that ball just hit him in the heel of the glove. Not great position to block that ball, but it just skittered far enough away to allow Davis who was heads up at first base. He got a very good read on that ball in the dirt, was breaking for second base as that ball was hitting in the dirt. Well, they're going to pitch to Girardi with first base open, a three and one count. He nearly made a pay along with his teammate. Oh, that was scary. Oh, Shane Andrews leading off in foul territory down that third baseline, and Joe Girardi very nearly took his head off with that screaming line drive. Put that ear flap on the other side as you're coming down that third baseline. Of course, that's why the runners lead off in foul territory. Had that ball struck Shane Andrews in foul territory, it would have been a foul ball. If Andrews is in fair territory, he would have been ruled out. Joe Girardi really turning on that fastball. Joe Girardi is not what I would call a pull hitter. And once again, had the count in his favor, was looking for one pitch, got it, and really hit it with authority. Unfortunately for him, foul. Cubs trying to recapture the lead, and it's ball four, high and away. The Cubs have the bases loaded with nobody out. Sixth walk of the game issued by Hampton. If you're wondering at home, is anybody getting loose in the Mets bullpen? Well, that's news to us as well. The bullpens are underneath the stadium. I thought there was something different. There's no bullpens here. Lieber, a 121 hitter a season ago with two runs batted in. Outside of low ball one, Lieber hit a fly ball quite well into left center field, caught by Hamilton his first time up. Nieves Girardi aboard with none out. A ball a strike. Well, you ask and you shall receive. Pat Mahomes, the right-hander. Rich Rodriguez, the left-hander, beginning to crank it up down 
underneath the stadium in that Mets bullpen. Boy, our Fox Sports Net cameras are everywhere. Well, I know they must have a monitor down there. Otherwise, how would they know what's going on in the game? Foul out of play. One and two now to Lieber. And both dugouts, incidentally, do have monitors that show the other team's bullpen and what's going on down there. Hampton needing a strikeout. Or the ground ball double play here. The Cubs have them loaded with nobody out. And the one two to Lieber. Fouled away. This is where somebody on the Cubs bench is probably yelling at John Lieber right now. If you feel like you're going to hit into a double play, strike out. Right. Of course, it's not that easy, but uh, that's the sentiment right now for Don Baylor. Geez, I'd sure like to see you get a base hit, but uh, I'd hate to see that ground ball at Ray Ordonia. So if you feel like you're going to hit a ground ball at somebody, go ahead and strike out. Come on back, put the jacket on, let the top of the order go to work. One and two again, pitcher versus pitcher, and Lieber able to hang in there. Puts a bat on the ball and fouls it out of play. Well, he's been able to hang in there on a couple of slow breaking balls from Mike Hampton. Maybe time to go up the ladder with a fastball. Most pitchers have a little trouble hitting that high fastball, and Lieber obviously very much in a defensive mode up there at the plate. Might just chase a bad pitch up high out of the zone. Hampton on the ropes here in the fourth inning. Bases loaded with nobody out. One, two to Lieber. Missed down and away. Very uncharacteristic Mike Hampton. He just doesn't seem to be able to find a comfortable release point. He's missed high. He's missed low. Missed inside, outside. No real rhyme, no reason. I mean, many times you can point out a mechanical problem and correct it and get back into the strike zone. Strike three call. First out in the inning for Mike Hampton. On his first strike out of the game. Good pitch on the outside corner. You'll see Lieber bailing out. Watch the front side of his body go down that first baseline. The rear end is not real anxious to stay in there. And Hampton takes advantage and throws him a fastball on the outside corner. And Lieber just cannot react in time. So now it'll be Eric Young. Bases loaded one away. And Young looks at a strike. Good pitch here by Hampton on the inside corner. Obviously, Young runs extremely well. Very difficult to double up Eric Young. And particularly with Joe Girardi, the runner at first base, getting a big lead off, a very aggressive slider into second base. Well, this could be a double. Piazza to Zeal, not an easy play on either end. The ball chopped out in front of plate. Hampton with a nice play, a pirouette. The toss to Piazza, the relay to first. We stay tied at one. Yes. one one ball game. Mike Hampton delivers big time for the Mets in the bottom half of the third. We caught up with Mike Piazza yesterday and asked him about What's his number one priority going into this 2000 season? People aren't ever going to admit it, but that's my number one job is to go out and catch. I mean, I think hitting for me always just has been natural. I try to make it natural as well as uh, working a lot on it. But when I get in a game situation, there's nothing I'm thinking about as far as mechanically or anything like that. I'm just trying to see the ball and hit the ball. He certainly is a natural hitter. He's proven that throughout his career. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, he's worked very hard on his defense. He boxed a couple balls back there tonight, catching Mike Hampton. And Hampton a little over juiced out there on the mound, throwing the ball all over the place, which is always tough for any catcher when your pitcher's not consistently within the strike zone. But I love to hear that from Mike Piazza. Any catcher, your number one role with that ball club is what you do behind the plate. Piazza, look at that batting average. Our Toyota leaders, top averages in the 92nd only to Tony Gwynn. He's down a strike. And you know, Bobby, I mean, Piazza's an easy target for a lot of people. 
He's a great star in baseball. He's a good looking guy. He's very articulate. He's fun to be around. I mean, he's got it all. But one thing he doesn't get enough credit for, this guy is just a tireless worker. That ball smoked in the left center field, a base hit. But I mean, the amount of time that this guy puts in trying to better his game, whether it's hitting, whether it's behind the plate, one of the hardest working guys in baseball. And this is one of the hardest hit balls you will ever <laughs> see that doesn't leave a ballpark. Tremendous extension into the zone. Great follow through the head right down the barrel of the bat. Follows the ball all the way to contact, keeps his head down all the way through follow through. I would not want to get in front of that line drive right there. I mean, that got out there to Henry Rodriguez on two hops and almost knocked his glove off, and he's standing about 360 feet away. In the air, straightaway center off the bat of Robin Ventura. And Piazza retreats back to first base, one away in the inning. You saw that graphic a moment ago. Piazza. Lasted nearly 1,400 picks coming out of college. So everybody dropped the ball on this guy. <laughs> well, they say scouting is an inexact science. I guess that is proof right there. Yeah, I, I still have to agree somewhat with the people that say Piazza would be better served with a position. I understand his willingness to go back there. I understand his desire to be a leader from behind the plate. But offensive players of his caliber come along so rarely in this game. Anything that will extend his career as an offensive threat, I think is something that should be done. But yeah, Mike Piazza is a very strong, very stubborn man. He wants to be behind the plate, and I will never fault a man for wanting to put those tools on. Well, there's a lot of talk when Olerud left before they brought Seal on board that would they go ahead and make that change and move Mike Piazza to first base. It's a fly ball and a short right. It's going to fall in for a hit. Piazza advancing on to second. Derek Bell, his first hit in a New York Mets uniform. A little floater into right field in front of Sammy Sosa. So watch this ball does not bounce very high off the AstroTurf. The players were amazed when they first came into the Tokyo Dome. As you walk on this artificial surface, it feels like very springy AstroTurf. But talking to the infielders, talking to the outfielders before the ball game, they say the ball does not bounce high off the turf. Perfect example right there. That ball barely got up to head high on Sammy Sosa. Well, we asked Daryl Hamilton about this AstroTurf in the Tokyo Dome. Uh, we worked out here a couple days ago. It's a little different. Uh, it looks spongy, but looks are deceiving. The ball stays on the ground pretty much the whole time, and I was surprised that because usually turf fields is bouncing all over the place. Todd Seal looked to the strike. And that certainly changes the way that the outfielders will charge balls like that one hit in front of Sammy Sosa. Generally in the States, especially on a hot, humid day, you'll see the outfielder lay back 50 feet behind that ball to make sure it doesn't bounce over their head. But that ball reacted much like a ball bouncing off a natural grass field. Two on, one out for Zeal. Swing and a miss. Lieber threw that one right by him. No balls and two strikes to Zeal. Take one more look at the bounce. A lot of English on that ball. You see it kind of checks up toward the foul line. It's still spinning as it hits Sammy's glove and bounces down to the turf once again, but didn't get far enough away. 0 oh, 2 to Zeal. And he fouls it back to the screen. And you can see even on the 0-2 count, John Lieber coming right down the heart of the plate with a little bit of movement, trying to get Todd Zeal to put the ball in play to his defense and get out of this inning with the, as few pitches as he can throw as possible. Well, Lieber's not afraid. He'll challenge him. Absolutely. And he's got good enough stuff to do that as long as he keeps the ball down in the strike zone. Piazza at second, Bell at first, and that one just off the outside corner and low. Oscar Acosta, Acosta, I beg your pardon, the pitching coach for the Cubs this year, was the pitching coach for Kerry Wood as he came up through the minor league system of the Chicago Cubs. It was a very good working relationship with Kerry Wood, and of course the Cubs and the Cubs fans are anxiously awaiting the return of the big right hand. And we asked Don Baylor about it again before the game today. He said, look, I said June because that's a very cautious approach. We're not going to do anything with Kerry Wood until the doctors say, cool, he's ready to roll. 
no problems and that's the case so far for Wood but they're bringing him along slowly but surely. Well, we're all rooting for that guy to come back. Oh, he was great for the game of baseball last year. A lot of fun to watch. One two. Zeal pops it up into foul ground. Grace will chase it and it's fouled out of play. Well. Outside of Baylor coming over and joining the Cubs as the manager, the focal point in Mesa, Arizona, all spring, the progress of Kerry Wood. And I mean, every side session that he threw, every spring training pitch that he threw was closely monitored, not only by the Cubs staff, by the medical staff, and of course by Cubs fans all around the world. Don Baylor said it himself, I've forgotten what a good fastball sounded like. And there are no problems with Wood's fastball clock 97, 98 miles per hour. And that pitching staff needs him back. Along with Ismael Valdez, a scheduled opening day starter, a little tendonitis in his shoulder. Fastball inside to Zeal, two and two. They expect to have Valdez back by the second or third week in April. They get those two guys back. It's a solid starting rotation to go with John Lieber, Kevin Tappany, and Kyle Farnsworth, the youngster who starts tomorrow night. 2-2 two, two to Zeal. Just missed. Come on, come on. Well, I don't believe there are any teams in the major leagues that could afford to lose your number one and two pitcher and really feel very good going into the regular season. But the Cubs are hoping, as you mentioned, to get Woods back quickly, Valdez. Hopefully back quickly and when the Cubs have those guys in place their rotation very representative should be able to compete with everybody in their division. Three two to zeal pickoff attempted second and Piazza saw it coming. One run three hits for the Cubs one run five hits for New York. The Cubs have the bases loaded with nobody out in the top of the fourth inning and failed to score. The Mets are trying to get their first lead of the game here in the bottom of the inning. Runners go. And Zeal is a fly ball in the right center. Plenty of room for Buford. Two down. And Piazza tag it up. He's coming to third. Here's a throw. And it's not in time. Good base running there by Mike Piazza. Oh, great base running and great hustle. As you mentioned, the runners were on the move. Piazza was about two thirds of the way down to third base saw the ball in the air. We're going to get a look at it here. He's on the move balls in the air. That's deep enough. I think I can tag. He hustles back to the bag at second tags up hustles once again back into third base and is able to get back in standing up as the throw is up the line away from the bag. That'll win a few of the fans over last year that found a reason to boo Piazza on a pretty regular basis. I was critical of Mike Piazza a couple of years ago when he was having contract problems with the Los Angeles Dodgers. He didn't run hard to first base on a fly ball to the outfield and I said if a guy's trying to get a hundred million dollars I want to see him run 90 feet and I will honestly say that's the only time I've ever seen Mike Piazza not run out of ball. That was more representative of what Mike Piazza is to a ball club what we just saw on that play. So now Ordonez, the number eight hitter in the lineup with Piazza at third, Derek Bell across the diamond at first in this 1 1 game. Lieber delivers, and it's outside and high 2 0 with a pitcher Hampton on deck. But the way Hampton has pitched in the game, granted he got out of the jam in the fourth, but he's thrown a lot of pitches. He really has thrown a lot of pitches. I mentioned no kind of limitations on Hampton or Lieber in this ball game, no pitch counts or anything like that. But by the same token, you don't want to send your ace out to the mound at first start of the year and have a high pitch count. Obviously laboring out there on the mound throughout this ball game. He's up to 79 pitches already in this game here in the fourth inning. And you've got a fresh bullpen. These guys down in the bullpen are anxiously looking for work as well. Two o to Ordonez, a strike on the outside corner. Yeah, one thing that may weigh into Bobby Valentine's choice as to whether to allow Hampton to hit for himself or not is the fact he is a good hitter as we mentioned earlier. A lot of pitchers can keep themselves in the ball game for a couple more innings if they're able to put the ball in play. Runners on the corners with two away. And a fastball is inside on Ordonez three balls and a strike. Well Girardi went out to the mound after the two and zero count. And obviously they made the decision that they're going after Ordonez. 
wonder if that's changed on three and one as Girardi looks in. They seem taking a look over to the Cubs dugout there just to make sure they're all on the same page. This pitch will determine. It looks like a sinker inside. A nice move by Joe Girardi there. We saw him set up inside on Ray Ordonez, knowing that John Lieber was going to throw a pickoff attempt to first base. If that batter happens to take a peek back there to see where the catcher set up, he sees Joe Girardi set up on the inside corner. Let's see where he goes with this pitch. Back away. And it's ball four. First walk of the game issued by Lieber. Some of that cat and mouse that goes on uh, behind the scenes in the game of baseball. Girardi had called for the pickoff throw to first base. He knew there was not going to be a pitch delivered to home plate. He knew the next pitch was going to be delivered to the outside part. So he intentionally set up on the inside corner to try to decoy the bat. Mike Hampton and Derek Bell joined this team during the offseason two days before Christmas and what a Christmas present it was to New York Mets fans. Bases loaded with two away. Hampton looks at a strike. He knocked in a whopping 10 runs in the number nine hole last season. And Hampton really reflected the attitude of that entire Houston Astros ball club, Biggio and Bagwell. Very aggressive gamers. And Mike Hampton, as I mentioned earlier, he could have been a position player. 6.30 in the morning in New York City, 5.30 in Chicago, 2.30 or 3.30 for those of you on the West Coast. Tom Brenneman, Bob Brenly, Chip Carey, our entire Fox Sports Net crew, 1-1 game in the fourth inning. Mets have the bases loaded. And Hampton may have broken his bat. Nope, fouled it off up the first baseline. He's still behind at 0-2. They see Hampton with that big elbow guard on. He's a left-handed pitcher, but a right-handed hitter. His pitching arm is exposed. To that pitcher out there, and uh, a lot of pitchers are opposite hitters. Randy Johnson comes to mind immediately, and I think it's a good idea for the pitchers to wear that big old arm brace. Base is loaded, and again, Hampton able to fight it off. The Cubs struck first in the first against Hampton, who walked Eric Young to begin the game. Young stole second and scored on the first hit in the new millennium by Damon Buford. The Mets tied the game in the third inning. Singles by Ordonez, a sack bunt by Hampton, a single by Henderson, and a sack fly run batted in by Hamilton. That's where we stand in the fourth. It's Hampton hanging around. Fouls it out of play. It stays 0-2. Yeah, much like a hitter, Mike Hampton just trying to foul off enough pitches to get John Lieber to make a mistake up in the strike zone where he can drive that ball through the infield. Try to drive in the go-ahead run. Oh, there's a guy that's been happy the last couple of days here in Japan. Big, big fan favorite, Bobby Valentine. And it's a one hopper. And great, what a play by Grace at first. And he'll take it to the bag to end the inning. Chip Carey will come on board and handle the play by play in the fifth. Look at this play with all the English on this ball by Grace. Four gold gloves on his mantle at home. We remain tied at one in Tokyo. Centuries old traditional garden, formerly the property of an Edo era samurai. A lot like Robert Brenly, it's now located on hotel grounds in the heart of the Akasaka district of Tokyo. Ah, beautiful place here in downtown Tokyo. Tokyo in a nutshell. If you haven't been, it's some kind of place. Bobby, 8.7 million. How many people per square mile? That would be at come out around 38,158 <laughs> people per square mile. 13 subway lines. We've ridden most of those the last couple of days. Average elbow room at the restaurants. Forget about it. It is some kind of place. Boy, Folks, if really you get is. a chance to come, make sure you do it at least once in your lifetime. And I, I know you feel this way, Bobby. I know I do. What a treat it is to come over here as an ambassador of Major League Baseball here in the capital of Japan. Uh, it, it really is, Chip. I mean, there are some very recognizable players. Obviously, everybody knows Sammy Sosa, Mike Piazza. We mentioned Bobby Valentine, a big favorite here. Tommy Lasorda has been around the ballpark the last couple of days. But you know, the, the, the natives here, the, the, the citizens of Tokyo, they know if you don't belong here. <laughs> and given the fact that this game is such a big deal, they, they realize that you probably have something to do with the ball game. So 
Yeah, people are giving you that little extra look. Well, how about this ball game? A 1-1 affair. Mike Hampton has been wildly effective, and the Cubs have had all kinds of chances to score, but haven't been able to do it. And Mike Hampton, uh, like most of the Mets pitchers did last year, really relying on his defense behind him. Three double plays to bail him out of those jams that he got in. And what a play to help himself the last half inning. A racing of bases loaded threat by the Cubs in the fourth. So Damon Buford leads things off here in the fifth. Buford today is singled home the only Cub run. He's also walked as you and Tom mentioned. Buford originally seventh in Don Baylor's batting order today. But with Ricky Gutierrez having the rib cage problem. Don shuffled his lineup moves Buford into the number two hole in the Chicago lineup. How about that shot. Little rocket shot. To the right side, Alfonso guessed right. The ball skidded to his left, and it's a leadoff base hit. So Buford's aboard here in the fifth inning, and friends, be sure and tune in tomorrow as Mike Piazza and the Mets take on Sammy Sosa and the Cubs in game two of opening series 2000. All the action from the Big Egg in Tokyo, Japan, can be seen only on Fox Sports Net. Check your local listings in your region for game time, and don't miss any of this historic action. Lead-off single for Damon Buford, and now the heart of the Cub order comes calling, and Mark Grace hits a shot to Derek Bell in right, and there's out number one. The all-time hits leader in the decade of the 90s, Mark Grace, gives way now to Sammy Sosa. Yeah, Grace, a perfect guy to play hit and run with. And normally a guy that works deep in the count. I think perhaps Don Baylor was going to allow Mark Grace to work deep in the count, pick a pitch to hit. Grace got one he liked on the first one. Very rarely will Mark Grace chase that first pitch, but he did hit it hard. Unfortunately for him, right at the right fielder. And here's a man who's real happy to see the regular season come. Sammy Sosa had another spectacular spring for the Cubs. It did end, however, for him in an 0 for 15 slide, and that has some of the fans here in Tokyo a little bit concerned about which Sammy Sosa they'll see in this two-game series. Well, it's kind of similar to the batting practice that he took before the game today. His first two rounds, he hit about 30 ground balls to the left side of the infield. His last three rounds, he hit about 30 balls into the seats. Outside to Sosa, two balls, no strikes. You can be sure that Sammy won't get cheated, however. Sign all the way from Wrigley Field. We see a few of those on Chicago's <laughs> north side, and look at the numbers for Sammy Sosa. 66 and 63. That Central Division will be a lot of fun to watch this year. The Reds, the Cardinals, the Cubs. Don't forget the Astros. And Jeff Bagwell had better stock up on some of those new Major League Baseballs that are debuting here tonight with Bud Selig's signature on them. It's going to be the Homer Happy Central this year, the year 2000. Everybody kind of forgets Jeff Bagwell in the talks about McGuire. As Sammy's, he's big here. He's all over the place. <laughs> yes, he is. Two balls and a strike. Swung late. I started to mention people talk about Junior and, and Big Mac and Sammy in the home run race. Jeff Bagwell, a notorious pull hitter. As you get a look at Sosa swinging through an outside fastball, Bagwell, a notorious pull hitter, moving into Enron Field, a very pull hitter friendly ballpark. I mean, Bagwell hit 42 homers last year. Only 12 of those came at home. That figures to change. Oh, that just missed. Count runs full three and two. We'll see if Damon Buford does some running here with one man out. I think Bagwell said it best about the Central Division, Bobby. Scoring's not going to be the problem. <laughs> it's stopping the other guys from scoring that's going to be the problem. And yeah, that's where Don Baylor's theory about playing the game fundamentally sound. Don't give away outs. Play solid defense and take advantage of your opportunities as they present themselves offensively. Three balls, two strikes to Cub right fielder Sammy Sosa. Buford good lead. And Todd Seal holds him over at first. Ball four. Another walk for Hampton. 
We had asked Mike Hampton, uh, how do you go about getting Sammy Sosa out? He has a definite theory on how to do it. If Sammy gets you where you can't get the ball inside and, and he can just start looking outside, it's going to kill you. If you, uh, if you can't get the ball away for a strike, he's going to look inside. So uh, for me to be successful against him, I've got to work both sides of the plate, keep him guessing. I can't get him looking for one pitch and sitting on one pitch. If he does that, you know, he's going to have has a good chance to hit the ball hard. So two on for the Cubs once again here in the fifth inning. Boy, it's been opportunities lost and opportunities wasted for the Cubs so far on this night, Bobby, and that was a big problem for them in 1999. You really have to take advantage of the opportunities, as I said, as they present themselves. You never know when a scoring opportunity is going to pop up in a ball game. Right now, the Cubs once again with a chance to do some damage. Henry Rodriguez was at the plate back in the third inning after three consecutive walks by Mike Hampton and Henry Rodriguez swung at the first pitch. That's one of those fundamentals that will not make Don Baylor real happy. And I'm sure Don Baylor pointed that out to Henry after the inning was over. But how about Hampton? Seven walks, but he's still in a 1-1 ball game. Now he's walked seven men before in a game. He did it last August 29th against the Marlins, won the game 10-4 if you can believe walking on a very 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 thin margin 92 pitches for Hampton already in the game well, knowing Mike Hampton the way we do however I don't think he would mind if he walked 17 batters in this game as long as his team was leading when it was all done but right now he has very little command quite obviously and he's losing command with his fastball. He's missing high and in as you get a look at his pitch count up to this point. He's missing way off the plate when he tries to hit the corners. Really, he's had better success throwing his breaking ball for strikes. Well, let's see what he has in mind now with a 3 1 count. There is that breaking ball. Now it's 3 and 2. And sometimes as a catcher, and of course, Mike Piazza will learn more about Mike Hampton as the regular season goes on. Sometimes that's what you have to do. Dave Wallace, Mike Piazza, they're going to have to learn what Mike Hampton needs to get himself back into that group. Perhaps it's to throw more breaking balls. Runners lead first and second for the Cubs. And that's upstairs. Eight. Mike Hampton walks. And again, the Cubs have loaded the bases, this time in the fifth. Amazing. It really is amazing. Dave Wallace, taking a look at the lineup card there. We mentioned a couple of innings ago the Mets had Pat Mahomes and Rich Rodriguez warming up in the bullpen. Of course, the double play has been his best friend in this ball game. A well placed ground ball right here. The Mets are going to be swinging the bats in a matter of minutes. Shane Andrews, the hitter, he has walked, he has singled here tonight. And he takes away ball one. Oh, those commuters heading into the Big Apple. What are they thinking right now in a 1 1 game? Mike Campton in his Met debut has walked eight. And we're only in the fifth. Well, Mike Campton was able to pitch out of a jam back in the fourth inning with the bases loaded. One out. Got the comebacker off the bat of the very speedy Eric Young. A little pirouette. The one, two, three double play to bail the Mets out of the inning. As Dave Wallace, the pitching coach, makes his way out to the mound to have some words with Mike Hampton. This may just be a stalling tactic. Perhaps it's a strategy meeting. Maybe just to take a little air out of the ball here to use a basketball term. <laughs> <laughs> well, the four corners might help him. So far, the Cubs have not been able to crack Mike Hampton, at least not yet. They loaded him in the third, loaded them in the fourth. They've loaded them again in the fifth. And it's Shane Andrews with a big chance to put the Cubs in front for the second time tonight. Now he's got a whole opportunities he can sit on a couple of pitches three and oh well, this is where as a hitter you pick one pitch in one zone if it's not there you take it the count is still very much in your favor you figure to get another good pitch to hit on the three one count the three oh taken all the way 
obviously a pitch that Shane Andrews did not want as we see the right hander Pat Mahomes continuing to throw in that Mets bullpen. Three balls one strike. All four. Oh and you hear Hampton scream come on he thought that was good enough. But he walks in Damon Buford with the go ahead run. Buford wears number nine. Shane Andrews is walk number nine, and it's a 2 1 Chicago lead. I'm not sure if Mike Hampton was upset with home plate up by Randy Marsh or upset with himself. We mentioned at the top of the show a very aggressive competitor. That pitch is obviously off of the outside corner. We've seen it called a strike, depending on the man working behind the plate, but. Piazza reaches across his body outside that right shin guard to catch that pitch. That's off the outside corner. Jose Nieves, the Cubs shortstop, takes a breaking ball. And for the Mets, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. Remember game six last year against Atlanta? Kenny Rogers walked in the game winning run. Mike Hamptons walked nine into the fifth. Chopper pulled foul and Avis in a quick 0 2 hole. And Hampton knocking at the door of a dubious New York record. Now those are not the kind of records no. you want your name attached to. The Cubs have him loaded again. Sosa at third, Rodriguez at second, Shane Andrews at first. The 0 2. Davis pulls that ball toward third. Ventura to second one. On to first. Another New York double play. Four double plays by New York in the ball game, but Mike Hampton's wildness has cost him the lead. He's walked nine, trails 2-1. As we head to the home half of the fifth at the Big Egg in Tokyo. What can you say about Mike Hampton? He's been wild, but he's still in this ball game, Robert. Two to one in favor of the Cubs, despite nine Mike Hampton walks. Well, he's learning a very valuable lesson as this game goes on that his defense will <laughs> yes. get him out of jams. Uh, obviously, he would like to pitch ahead in the count and retire hitters much easier, but his defense has turned four double plays behind him, something that he can rely on all season long. Four New York double plays have doomed the Cubs so far tonight. But hey, how about New York? They've been to Japan before 26 years ago 1974 they even made him feel right at home copying the Shea Stadium scoreboard Yogi Berra of course leading the way for New York and Tom terrific anchoring that great New York pitching staff and that's won their series against the Japanese teams nine seven and two and yes they do allow ties in Japanese baseball. Bobby Valentine familiar as well managed the Chiba Lotte Marines to their best record in quite some time back in 1995. And he's leading perhaps his best New York team into Japan here in the year 2000. It's a very pivotal year not only for Bobby Valentine for Steve Phillips their general manager and for a lot of players on this New York team. They are expected to advance perhaps even win the World Series. They're already talking perhaps about a subway series in New York and we're just underway in the 2000 campaign. I think if you see a weakness with the Mets we've talked about their strong infield defense their starting rotation seems to be in good hands a lot of offense. The outfield defense however would would raise a red flag I believe we mentioned Derek Bell in right field kind of wavers defensively. Ricky Henderson has been known to turn the switch on and off at times in left field and Daryl Hamilton uh, the aging Daryl Hamilton still very solid out there in center field but he's forced to cover a lot of ground. Ricky ropes it foul past third. You and Tom mentioned earlier that there have been talks that this man may be destined for Detroit. How does Bobby Higginson help New York more than Ricky Henderson? Well I'm not so sure if I know the answer to that. I'm, I'm not that familiar with Bobby Higginson. I know that he was a, a bright young star a few years ago. He's fallen on hard times the last couple years but a lot of baseball people feel he has a tremendous upside and I think people uh, uh, look more at what Ricky does uh, off the field than what he does on the field. Ricky's going to give you what he has given every team he's ever played for. He's going to get on base. He's going to score runs. He's going to steal bases. He's occasionally going to flake out in left field. 13 seasons with 100 or more runs, seven with 100 or more walks. He makes things happen. 
He hits a rocket deep toward right, but playable for Sammy Sosa. And Henderson flies out for out number one. No doubt about it, no matter what happens to Ricky Henderson with regard to his Mets career, that is a walking, talking, base-stealing Hall of Fame. And the only question I would think in Ricky's case is what, uh, what uniform will go in the hall? That is a good question. <laughs> there have been many. There have been many. And he has played with distinction everywhere he's been. Here's Daryl Hamilton. He has the lone Met RBI, a sacrifice fly back in the third. Very quietly, John Lieber just going about his business. Not a dazzling performance, but that's John Lieber at his best. Uh, this is just, uh, I think a lot of pitchers could learn a lesson from John Lieber. Get the ball, throw it over the plate with a little bit of movement, let your defense work behind you. Try to get your defense back in the dugout as quickly as you can. Give them a chance to score some runs for you. Leads at two to one as you see here in Tokyo and Hamilton pawing around in that left hand batter's box that has become one of the stories of this ball game. The dirt surfaces here at the Tokyo Dome very sandy very slippery. And that's the pitch Lieber has been working on so very hard trying to get that change up over to left hand hitters. That's fouled off Hamilton's foot, I thought, but instead it's bounced to Young, and he's retired for out number two. Well, we've talked to Joe Girardi, John Lieber's catcher, about John Lieber, and what kind of a pitcher is he out there on the mound? John Lieber's a, a pitcher who likes to get the ball and throw it. He works fast, and players appreciate that because you're always on your toes. He's a sinker ball pitcher with a slider, and he's developed a changeup during spring training and we hope to use that to uh, you know keep the left handed hitters off stride a little bit more and obviously he's a location pitcher and uh, when he's on his location's great. Here's Edgardo Alfonso he takes a quick strike Alfonso has doubled and has struck out. What a year this man had for the Mets last year. Up out of play right side. 27 homers, 108 runs driven, and 41 doubles, and again that 300 batting average at a new position. And he's just such a smooth player, Chip. Very, very intelligent, always gets himself in a good position. We saw him break the wrong way on a ground ball earlier in this game, which is the first time I've ever seen Edgardo Alfonso be out of position. Chopper toward Andrews at third. Grace couldn't dig it out. Something you don't see very often either. You see Grace pawing at the dirt over there at first base. Obviously, a bad throw by Shane Andrews in the dirt, but Mark Grace has picked thousands of those out of the dirt for his Cubs infielders. It's going to be ruled an error on Andrews. Took a little too much time unloading that throw across the infield through Mark Grace's sinker in the dirt. And once again, the dirt comes into play here at the Tokyo Dome, this time at first base. I think Gracie caught more dirt than ball. On that particular throw. So that brings Mike Piazza to the plate with a runner aboard. That's the last thing Lieber wanted to see happen in this situation. And this is a spot where you know Piazza has the fangs glaring and blaring. Piazza is grounded to third and he has singled tonight. Two balls, no strikes. Dangerous count here for John Lieber. Mike Piazza, a good low fastball hitter. Lieber, a sinker ball pitcher, as we mentioned. After falling behind 1 0, he tried to get a swinging strike on that slider down low and away. And you can see what Mike Piazza has done in his career against the sinker baller, John Lieber. A high pop had him out of the front foot. Sosa playing deep charges in. Eric Young drifts out. He's got it, and Lieber dodges the Andrews air. We're through five in Tokyo. What a debut for the 2000 season. The Cubs lead the Mets 2-1. to one. Mike Hampton's night is complete. Robert, nine walks, and he leaves trailing by a run. Well, certainly not the kind of debut with his new ball club that Mike Hampton was hoping for, but once again, his competitive nature, his aggressiveness, he didn't pitch well, but his team is still in the ballgame. And he'll give way to former Cub right-hander Turk Wendell, who had a terrific year last year for New York, a rubber-armed right-hander who knows how to pitch but maybe doesn't know how to track mountain lions too well. They had a little problem with that this winter. You, know, you say that term rubber arm. That used to be a derogatory thing, you know, in high school. Sure. Pitchers got a rubber arm. 
<laughs> I'm telling you, a lot of managers in baseball would take a rubber arm like Turk Wendell and able to take that ball. He pitched in 80 ball games last year. Slider after slider after slider. He'll mix in an occasional sinking fastball, an occasional changeup, but tremendous control of his slider. He's able to make it break short and sharp or wrap around it a little bit and make it a little bit bigger breaking ball. You can Top of the hour here in Tokyo. It's 9 o'clock local time. And every night at 9 o'clock, they put down new lines on the batter's box here in Tokyo. It's amazing, it isn't is. it? it really they is. are very punctual here in Tokyo. And we're glad you're with us in the morning back in the States. 7 o'clock Eastern time. Hope the traffic's not too bad. As you make your morning commute, don't spill your coffee. That's right. Buckle up, wear your seatbelt. And Wendell and the New York Mets and Chicago Cubs better put on the seatbelts as well. Four more innings of baseball tonight in the Tokyo Dome, and then another ball game tomorrow. And then both teams jet back to the good old USA on Friday. So here we go. Joe Girardi set to lead things off. Girardi, then John Lieber, and then Eric Young for the Cubs, who lead two to one. Joe Girardi. misses with ball walk. The Cubs totally revamped the heart of their defense. New catcher, new second baseman, new shortstop, new center fielder. Girardi, of course, the former Cub who went to Colorado in the expansion draft, won all those World Series rings with the New York Yankees. But this man brings an awful lot to this Chicago Cubs organization. Well, he brought a lot to the Cubs organization the first time around. But now, after all that experience, those World Series rings, and base hits up the middle like that one, he's back for his second go-round. I mentioned it earlier, Chip. It's like having another manager on the field behind the plate. So he's aboard with a leadoff sixth-inning single. We'll see if Lieber can butt him over and give the Cubs an insurance run here in Tokyo. Lieber 0 for 2, as you see, fly to center and struck out looking against Mike Hampton. And you would certainly anticipate Lieber trying to punt that ball to the new first baseman, Todd Zeal, learning a new position down there. Robin Ventura, obviously you don't want him to have the ball in any way, shape, or form. Well, that's what makes this Met team so tough. You hit the ball on the ground, you're out. They that's just, it. They just don't make errors. Mets infielders combined for 33 errors last year. And 68 as a team. That led all of baseball. You know who was number two in the National League in errors? The Phillies with 100. 32 more. <laughs> and only 20 unearned runs allowed by New York. And the Mets did play 162. Yes. 100, yeah, 162, just like everybody else. Labor draws the bat back. Wendell can't. Get the ball down, it's 2-0. And, oh. and the thing that's even more amazing about it, Chip, is most infielders will tell you that that Shea Stadium infield is one of the most brutal fields to pick ground balls on in all of baseball. And these guys made it look easy. Lever bunts it towards Ian. And a good sacrifice, three unassisted. If you're going to bunt the ball, that's the guy to bunt it to on this New York defensive infield but one thing good about it Todd Zeal took a look at second base a lot of first basemen will just concede that runner advancing into scoring position not even attempt to make a look but the first thing Todd Zeal does is get himself in position to throw to second base in his judgment he didn't have a play at second so he turned around applied the tag to John Lieber get the sure out I like to see that aggressive thinking on the part of Todd Zeal at first base and that comes from Keith Hernandez 11 time gold glove winner they've been working together since the opening of spring training. And here's Eric Young. Young walked, stole second, and scored the first run of the new millennium back in the first inning. Grounded to short, bounced into a brilliantly turned 1-2-3 double play to end the Chicago fourth. Girardi, a big insurance run for the Cubs at second here in the sixth. And again, it's 2-0. And watch how many times Turk Wendell goes to that slider. He missed just off the outside corner with a short, sharp breaking slider that time. Sometimes he'll wrap around it, make it a little bit bigger, kind of an American Legion curveball. There it is again, breaking ball, breaking ball, breaking ball. Turk not too happy with that pitch. Three balls, no strikes. And Piazza trying to settle him down behind the Pentagon. That's 
gets right through there three and one. Joe Girardi blessed with catcher speed. I know that pains you when I say <laughs> something like that. However, he is a very intelligent base runner will very rarely make a mistake on the bases. He knows when to try to take the extra base. Young pops it up and it's playable for Piazza. There's out number two. So Wendell makes a big pitch. Like our friend Dirty Harry Callahan said, Chip, a man has got to know his limitations. Joe Girardi knows his limitations. He's not going to steal a lot of bases, but he will take the extra base when it's needed. You're breaking out the Dirty Harry Callahan references again. I, I saw a bit of a, a Dirty Harry Callahan movie the other day in Chinese. Now there's a thrill. How much of it did you understand? None of it. I don't understand any of this stuff. I told Tommy that earlier. I am baffled, completely baffled. You're not the only one. Buford's been on base three times tonight. Cubs got him for his glove. How about his bat tonight? Two for two with an RBI, a run scored, and a walk. Yeah, take advantage of opportunities. You know, Don Baylor seeing a lot of guys, uh, as you see the video games being played. I wonder if he's got Damon Buford at the plate in the game. Swing and a miss, a ball and a strike. You know, I, I'll tell you, it's still very early in the season. Obviously, the Cubs have been through spring training, and Don Baylor has an idea of where everybody fits on this roster and their role with the ball club. But, you know, you get an opportunity to move up in that two slot in the lineup tonight. You make some noise with that bat. You make some things happen, and maybe you find yourself in that two spot again. One ball, one strike. Yeah, Don has said that his plan is to have Ricky Gutierrez bat in the number two spot on a regular basis. He toyed with the idea of having Joe Girardi bat second. But he likes Gutierrez's speed at the top of the order. Of course, Gutierrez unable to play tonight with a rib cage strain. His status is day to day. And the key for the Cubs is how often can Gutierrez and Young get on ahead of that man and Mark Grace. Two balls, two strikes to Damon Buford. From the Red Sox for Manny Alexander in the offseason. Girardi leading from second, two to one Cubs. Tip Piazza couldn't hang on, and you hear Wendell trying to umpire from 60 feet, six inches away. Well, Mike Piazza caught that one right in the heart. Breaking ball that kind of hung up over the plate a little bit for Damon Buford. He had a good cut at it. Pow! Right in the chest. I mean, that chest picker helps a little bit, but that, that'll still get your attention back there. And I, I'm not sure if Mike is grimacing or laughing at Wendell. <laughs> Well, he's very animated out there on the mound. I, I got to believe that the fans are going to like Turk Wendell the more they see him. Yes. Two balls, two strikes to Damon Buford. And he hangs tough here at the Tokyo Dome. How do you like this place? You, you know, surprisingly enough, Chip, we came in here yesterday to watch the exhibition game, and I thought, my God, what a big dome. You know, it, it looked huge standing behind home plate, but then the batters got in there for batting practice, and they were knocking balls off the scoreboard and all over the place. It's visually deceiving, I guess, is the best way to put it. It's not as big as it appears. Modeled after, after the Metrodome in Minneapolis. Oh, full count three and two. They were kind enough to put the dimensions of the ballpark on the fences before this game. 333 down the line, symmetrical ballpark with 406 to straightaway center. And another New York walk. That's 10 of them in the game in the first from Wendell. And now he has to face the Cubs best hitter, Mark Grace. With two on and two out. We've talked already about Turk Wendell, his bread and butter pitches that slider. And for a professional hitter like Mark Grace, he's going up there right now with the game plan in mind. As Dave Wallace makes his way out to the mound, tries to get Randy Marsh's attention before going out to the mound. Not sure if he's going to make a change right here or he's just going out to talk. Occasionally, Bobby Valentine will send his pitching coach out to make the pitching changes. He 
is going to make a change. Wendell works two thirds of an inning and he'll leave with two men on for the Cubs here in the sixth. Another opportunity for Chicago, but it's lefty versus lefty. Dennis Cook against Mark Grace. Smith's worn the Cubs uniform his entire major league career. Mark Grace, we asked him about his approach to hitting. I, I consider myself a situational hitter. Uh, if the situation calls uh, calls to pull the ball, I'll try to pull the ball. If the uh, situation calls for maybe trying to drive the ball in the gap or try to drive a home run, then I'll try to do something like that. Uh, I guess the best way to describe me would be uh, a tough out. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill you like a Sosa or a McGuire or a Junior or a Bagwell guy like that, but I can hurt you with base hits and doubles. Boy, and he's done plenty of that throughout his career. Mark Grace, talking about being a situational hitter, facing a tough left-hander in Dennis Cook. You see his numbers on the season last year. 10 wins out of that Mets bullpen. It would figure that Mark Grace right now is going to anticipate a pitch on the outside part of the plate and try to hit it to the opposite field to drive in a run. And that's the danger that Grace presents for the opposition. He can spray the ball all over the diamond. However, if Cook misses inside like that, look at the gap Grace has in right center field. A huge hole with which to work. See Mark Grace's hot zone, very much a low ball hitter, like most left-handers, down and in his happy zone, but even that pitch up and away at the 233 average, he can line that ball into left field if he's looking for it. Down and in again. Two balls, no strikes. Mark Grace's hot zone. This is the pitch I was talking about right here, that up and away pitch. He's very capable of taking that ball and hitting it to the opposite field, and one of the best two-strike hitters I have ever seen. Over 2,000 hits in his big league career. Accomplished that milestone last year in Chicago's Wrigley Field. And now Grace asks for and receives time. Cook taking a little too much time for him. Two many to one, Chicago the lead. I'm sorry, Chip. Many times if a pitcher has agreed to throw the pitch, gets into his stretch position, and then has second thoughts about it, they'll just stand there until the batter calls timeout, get a new sign, and start over. 2-0. -oh. Wrapped foul pass. Hall of Famer Billy Williams, the first base coach of the Chicago Cubs. There he is. A sweet swinger out of Whistler, Alabama. And another sweet swinger in that batter deck for the Cubs. These are the kind of confrontations I love to watch in the game. Dennis Cook, a veteran specialist out there on the mound. He's a lefty that comes in to work on left-handed batters. And Mark Grace, as we mentioned, one of the greatest hitters in his era. Two balls and a strike. Off the plate again, foul. And two and two. Dennis Cook on the last two pitches dropped down a little more sidearm. Tried to give Mark Grace a little different look. Didn't want to just lay a fastball in there 2-0, and oh, so he dropped down. Got the count to 2-1, and one, does it again. Now he's got the count back even to 2-2. Two and two. Here, watch the arm angle on Dennis Cook as he delivers this 2-1 pitch to Mark Grace. Oh, sidearm, just a little above sidearm there, but Grace doesn't give a bit. He is not a bale and whale kind of guy in that batter's box. Now we'll see what Cook has in mind with the deuces wild. Two on, two out. Two two count to Grace. <laughs> and again, <laughs> Cook has second thoughts. Dennis Cook had no intention of delivering that pitch right there. You could tell by the length of time he took looking back at second base. Neither one of his middle infielders is remotely close to the bag to hold the runner on. He just wasn't ready to throw the ball. He's just trying to slow the game down, take some of the momentum away from the Cubs offense. He's ready now. The 2-2. Again, he drops down sidearm. And again, Grace fights it off. Gracie playing less than 100%. He's got a broken finger on his right hand. The middle finger, to be exact. Gracie, a real throwback up there, bareback. Never wears gloves. Occasionally, he's worn gloves if it's been bitterly cold at Wrigley Field, but prefers that feel of wood in his hands. 2-2. Oh, he just missed, and Cook wanted it. Three balls, two strikes. Oh, 
this is what Mark Grace will do to you. You get to two strikes, you're still going to have to work to retire him. That man would love another chance to hit with runners on here in the Cubs sixth inning. Three, two, runners go. Gracie sends a rocket straight away center. Hamilton misjudged it, surrounded it, and caught it. Oh, look at Dennis Cook. A knuckleball hit to straightaway center in the Cubs strand. Two more. It's still 2-1 Chicago. Nothing like a little ice cream here at the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan. Good morning to all of you. The United States, Robin Ventura sent to lead things off. Mets down a run in the sixth inning. What a gamer this guy is, and what a signing by New York, and what a debut he had last year in a Mets uniform. He's a, a special player, Chip. And last year in the playoffs, game five, 15th inning. Who will forget about it? Kevin McGlinchey serves it up. Grand slam single. Grand slam single. A come from behind, win for New York. The Mets pulled to 3-2 in the series, but could not pull off the miracle Atlanta wanted. In six games to advance to the World Series, one of the longest singles you'll ever see in baseball. <laughs> but he had a great year, did Robin Ventura. 32 homers, drove in 120. 13 career grand slams, including two in one day last year. Hit grand slam in each game of a doubleheader. A former White Sox, now in New York. Mets could use a run. They're down two to one here in the sixth. And John Lieber takes something off. How do you think Lieber's done against the left-handers in the game tonight? Uh, much better than he did last year. He's been able to mix in, and I don't even know if it's a legitimate change-up, Chip. It just looks like he's taking a little bit off his sinker. Right there it is. Just trying to guide that off-speed pitch up there to the outside corner, perhaps get that lefty out in front just a little bit. But he really needed to come up with something to work on the left-handed hitters. This is a man, John Lieber, that was the only Cubs starting pitcher to register double-digit wins last year. He went 10 and 11, but did not win a single game after the All-Star break. And he's got too good a stuff to suffer through those kinds of woes. Now, granted, he pitched for a team that was, quite honestly, horrible last year. One of the worst Cub teams ever. This year, however, Don Baylor thinks he has a better team, and John Lieber will be a better pitcher. Ventura sends a high drive straight away right. Got under it a bit. And Sosa takes care of him. You know, Lieber has worked on the changeup. He mentioned to us earlier that he was working on that pitch very much in spring training. You know, besides throwing the two-seam sinking fastball that he'll take a little off, this is the grip that he uses on the changeup. Very similar to the circle change that you see Tom Glavin and a lot of other pitchers use. He prefers not to call it a circle change, but it's a, the same basic theory. The index finger and the thumb come together on the side of the ball there. You actually throw it with the two, the two middle fingers. Derek Bell, the batter, he hacks at the first pitch and is down a quick strike. A lot of guys in baseball that throw the circle change. There aren't too many that have the kind of success that the guys in Atlanta do. Still pretty good muster. One ball, one strike. They got him from the Pirates before last season for outfield Grant Brown. A terrific trade for Ed Lynch and the Cubs. Bounce toward Nevis at short. Bell slips and slides in that batter's box. And the youngster at short takes care of him. Two men down. We'll take a look at Derek Bell after hitting this ground ball to Nevis at shortstop. That was a slider that was really up high in the zone. And Bell spins his wheels coming out of that batter's box. Very frustrated after getting down to first base. and takes that long, slow walk back to the third base dugout. Two up, two down for Todd Zeal. Again, if you're just joining us, the dirt has been a very big factor in this ball game. Three or four Mets have stumbled out of the batter's box after making contact. Fortunately, no one has been hurt. But it is a very soft surface. 
Davis deep in the hole. Double clutch. Throw to first in time. Leonard Larson who takes care of Zeal. And John Lieber has his second one, two, three inning. Sammy Sosa set to lead it off for the Cubs in the top of the seventh. Stay tuned. It's 2-1 Chicago. Smile from Sammy Sosa. It lights up a stadium. It can light up a country. And you know what his bat can do to the scoreboard. It'll certainly light that thing up as well. It'll light up a pitching staff. A special treat for baseball fans all across the world at the end of this half inning. We'll be headed out to Harry Carey's in Chicago. And Dutchie Carey will be guest conducting the seventh inning stretch for the first time in the year 2000. Ah, nothing like a little scrambled eggs Vesuvio to start your day, right? There you go. I didn't know they served that day. They probably are today. <laughs> a full-blown pajama party. That's the dress code, right? That's what I understand. I'm glad I wasn't invited. Thank you. I'm glad you weren't invited. No, yeah, not the only one. <laughs> Two to one, our score. Tom Brenneman, Bob Brenneman. Chip Carey, our entire Fox Sports Net crew from Tokyo. Delighted you're with us this morning as we kick off the 2000 Major League season in Tokyo. It's Cook against Sosa. Sammy has walked twice and wrapped into one of four double plays turned by the Mets. Saw a reaction there from Dennis Cook. Tried to paint that outside corner with a low fastball. Didn't get the call from Randy Marsh. Kind of recoiled on the mound. Hey, when you're working against a hitter that can break a game open like Sammy Sosa, you want to get every borderline pitch because you don't want to have to throw it over the fat part of the plate. Took a little off, and Sosa has an even count, one and one. Little breaking ball that Dennis Cook just pulls the string on a little bit. Got Sosa well out in front. What a matchup. Sosa against Piazza. And now against Dennis Cook. And Cook misses low. That's dangerous territory against Sosa. Two balls and a strike. Well, you're usually okay if you keep it on that outside corner or further away. Cook has missed in almost identical spots with the first pitch and then again on the 1-1 pitch down low and away from Sammy. Let's see what he has in mind with a 2-1 count as Sammy leads off the Chicago 7. Nasty pitch. It's a little bit of movement right there. I don't know if that was a legitimate slider or maybe a little bit of a cut fastball that Cook runs down and into Sosa. That is a dangerous zone. That pitch down and in. But Cook had enough movement that Sammy couldn't get it. So he's battled back to a 2-2 count. Sosa, Rodriguez, and Andrews in the seventh. 2-2. Cook one of get missing in his favor. Let's take a look at Sammy's hot zone. That's that down and in pitch we talked about. That's his best pitch. Jamming him up and in with fastballs. We mentioned earlier in the game, when you get ahead of Sammy, you can get him to chase that fastball up high out of the strike zone. Full count, bases empty to Sosa. And he fought it off. The Mets very much in this ball game despite surrendering 10 walks the Cubs have left 10 men on base through six innings that may come back to haunt them in the seventh eighth and ninth if there is a weakness on this Cub team it is considered to be their bullpen three balls two strikes again to Sosa center is going to drop for a leadoff hit. Cook got the ball into Sosa's kitchen, but as enormously strong as he is, he fought it off and is aboard leading off the seven. Now watching Piazza give the signs, it appeared he had called for a changeup. Once again, you see Sammy's hot zone right there. That ball appeared to be down in this zone, kind of between two zones, if you will, the 223, the 292 area. He's able to fight it off, muscle it out into center field. So he's hitting about 247. Yeah, you so. know, if your math is good, quick with all that stuff. 
Now we'll see if Don Baylor turns him loose. This is a facet of Sosa's game that he wants to see improvement. He wants to see Sammy become a base stealer once again. I don't know if he'll ever be a 60-30 guy again, but certainly he's capable of stealing more bases than he showed in 1999. Well, Sammy looks to have bulked up considerably since the days when he was stealing 30 bases in a season. The emphasis the last couple of years, obviously, more on the long ball, and Sammy says, hey, I'm big and I'm strong and I'm going to hit the long ball, but the skipper wants me to run more, I'll run more. Henry Rodriguez takes a quick strike, too. Is a, one of those lefties, his delivery to home plate, the first thing that starts, he, he brings his hands up very high before he brings his leg up. Good base dealers can usually get a pretty good jump against Dennis Cook. Todd's deal not really holding Sosa, plays in front of him over at first. Sammy a foot on the carpet, pretty good lead. And time call. As Cook again. Very deliberate once he comes to that set position. Yeah, he wants to work in a certain rhythm. He's a veteran and knows how the game is played. An 0-2 count right here. He's not sure what Sammy's doing over there at first base. There's a lot of possibilities here. And Cookie just decided to slow the game down. Again the 0-2. Just did hold up. One and two the count. Take a look at Dennis, Dennis Cook's delivery to home play. Watch the first thing that moves, his hands will immediately go up. And then the leg comes up afterwards. He looks at home plate. He never looks at the runner at first base. On other pitches, he'll look at first base and never pick up the batter until he's on his way to the plate. A lot of deception in that delivery. One, two. It's high. Two balls, two strikes to the Cub left fielder, Henry Rodriguez. Cook sneaking up on his 500th career game. I would be surprised if he gets it tomorrow. Night. Pretty good chance. Much like Turk Wendell, Wendell, very rubber arm pitcher. You can throw him out there every day. The more they get the ball, the more they like. Two and two now. Sosa goes. Pitch ground ball just foul past first. Cubs play hit and run. Henry hit it to a perfect spot, but an eyelash foul. Rodriguez, the former Expo, the former Dodger, hit 300 for the first time in his big league career last year. Faces a 2-2 count. Another big lead by Sosa. Not going this time, and Henry swings and misses. So he goes down on strikes. First punch out for Dennis Cook. Now Cook is basically a two-pitch pitcher, but he will change speeds on him. There's going to be a changeup that actually hung up over the inside part of the plate, but the difference in speed between the fastball and the changeup was enough to get Rodriguez out in front. Sometimes you get away with bad pitches. And here's Shane Andrews. A base hit back in the fourth. His bases loaded walk in the fifth drove home the second and go ahead run for the Cubs. The Mets have walked 10 men in this game tonight. defense the way Zeal holds the runner at first. That's what Bobby Valentine has done the last couple of years, especially with a left-handed pitcher on the mound. It, it really is deceptive. I see a lot of runners breaking back to first as the ball's being delivered to the plate, but I look for Sosa to try to steal sometime in the next couple of pitches here, get himself into scoring position for Shane Andrews before you get down to the 7-8 inter Jose Diaz and Joe Girardi. Well, obviously, Cook is trying to pick off the runner. Experienced first baseman in Todd Zeal, there's a chance he can pick off his own teammate. I think that uh, I'm not sure about this, and I should find out before tomorrow night's game. I think there's a pre designated sign. Uh, Todd Zeal knows when Dennis Cook is coming over to first base. You see him jockeying there a little bit. Andrews rockets that off home plate umpire Randy Marsh for strike one. Yeah, but as a runner leading off first base and the first baseman is directly ahead of you, if he starts to move back toward the bag, your natural instinct is to protect yourself take an extra step back toward first base, which is exactly what the Mets want the runner to do. Cook 
has really slowed the game down. No balls and a strike to Shane Andrews. He hits a rocket deep toward right. Long run, Derek Bell still going back. Track at the wall, leaps up, it's gone. Shane Andrews goes the other way. The first home run hit in Japan. A two-run shot. And the Cubs have a 4-1 to one lead in the seventh inning. They've been searching since Santo for an everyday third baseman, and the Cubs think they might have found him off the waiver wire in Shane Andrews. Shane Andrews. Could, could turn out to be one of the feel-good stories of the season for Cubs fans. So he gets a pitch down and out over the plate and drives it to the opposite field, just barely over that wall in right field, but enough to get out of here for a two-run homer. Shane Andrews working a lot with Jeff Pentland in spring training this year, who was given a lot of the credit for Sammy Sosa's turnaround as a hitter. They're hoping they can do the same with Shane Andrews. Jose Nieves on the ground to Ray Ordonez. There's out number two. And Dutchie Carey starting to warble at Harry Carey's in <laughs> Chicago. We understand she has gotten into the spirit of things by dressing in a kimono. Is that right? Well, Dutchie looks good no matter what she's doing. Look at her. Go, Girardi. Argue with that. Here's Joe Girardi. <laughs> a swing and a miss. Shane Andrews, an opposite field home run. He hit five of them in 19 games for the Cubs last year. He hits one the other way on opening night tonight in Japan for a 4 1 Chicago lead. Girardi opposite field. Bell can't get that. Joe rounds first. Big turn puts on the brakes. And that's a big at bat for the Cubs for allows the pitcher to hit here in the seventh inning. Second hit for Girardi on the night. Girardi going to the opposite field, much like Shane Andrews on his two-run homer to right field. A little Jeffrey Meyer action out there in right field. You'll see as Bell goes back to the wall. One of the Young fans right there reaches out over the wall and appeared to make contact with the ball. It actually hit the top of the fence and bounced up into the young man's chest. We'll, we'll give him a break. A poor fielding crowd here in Tokyo. <laughs> yeah, no protest lodge, thank goodness. Here's Lieber. A three-run lead for him now as he tries to win on opening night in Japan. Still a ways to go in this game, however. The Mets the home team tonight. The Cubs will be the home team tomorrow night. him up again came side arm and Lieber had very little chance 0 and 2 it's very much a self-defense swing right here that ball so close he's afraid it's going to hit him so he swings at it just to try to fight it off very awkward swing by John Lieber but he's not up here to hit no balls two strikes right down the middle strike three called but Shane Andrews first homer of the year a two run shot gives the Cubs a 4-1 lead. It's opening night. It's the seventh inning stretch. Let's head to Chicago and Harry Carey's restaurant for Take Me Out to the ball game.
Collins, thank you very much. Oh, what a scene in Rosemont, Illinois. And Harry Carey's and a lot of Harry Carey and Cub and Met fans here. Another great ambassador, Hall of Famer Ernie Banks. Leading the Tokyo Dome crowd in the seventh inning stretch here as well. I saw Ernie Banks yesterday. He said, let's play two. As long as we're here, let's play two. Great ambassador for the game. 512 homers with the Chicago Cubs. 19 Major League seasons. Ernie Banks is here. Billy Williams here. Of course, Henry Aaron is here. Mr. Pett is here. He's legendary, too. <laughs> well, John Lieber just very quietly and effectively, Bobby. Now, four to one lead into the seventh inning. And if Don Baylor were to write an opening night script, I don't think he would have written anything better for the Chicago Cubs than what he has seen in this game tonight. Well, that really would have been a devastating loss had the Cubs not come back and take a lead in this game. We don't know if they're going to win or not, but they had so many opportunities, so many walks early in the game that they did not take advantage of. Something that Don Baylor's been trying to preach to his ball club throughout the early part of the season. So the Cubs have the lead. The Mets need to get busy here in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. They'll have Ray Ordonez, then the pitcher spot, and then the top of the order due in inning number seven. Ordonez has singled, scored, and walked in the game tonight. And Lieber, a quick strike. Cubs go with their defensive outfielder now. Eric Brock takes over for Henry Rodriguez in left. A chopper, one hop to Andrews. Snow cone dropped it, can't pick it up. And Ordonez is aboard. An inauspicious start for the Cubs, but maybe the break the New York Mets need here. See Andrews go up the ladder to make the play right there. Ball slips out of his glove, then he loses his balance going after it once again. That'll be ruled an error on Shane Andrews. That time the footing was lost on the turf itself. He was nowhere near the dirt that time. So it's feast or famine night for Andrews. A big two run homer, but both Cub errors. And now they've changed the scoring on that. It's ruled an Ordonez hit. How you scored it's a runner at first and nobody out and John Nunnally pinch hitting for Dennis Cook. The Mets still very much in this ball game especially when you consider the thunder that's lurking later in this inning or the eighth. And Alfonso Piazza Ventura and Bell. And now they have rechanged the score it is an error on Andrews on the Ordonez play. So two errors by Andrews. Eight hits for the Cubs, five for the Mets. As we battle on here in the home half of the seventh in Tokyo. Double play ball perhaps, four, six, Turn about is fair play. The Cubs turn a double play. Bases empty, two down, and the top of the Met order coming up. Strong throw by Jose Nieves at the end of this double play. He gets the feed from Eric Young, clears himself with a sliding runner, and really puts a lot on that relay throw to Mark Grace, just in time to get Nunley at first base. Defense was a problem for Nieves last year. Had a boatload of errors in his opportunity to start in the last month and a half for Chicago. Had both knees arthroscopically operated on in the offseason. He feels like a new man. And he's played very, very well defensively for the Cubs this spring. And he was able to turn that double play very nicely with a speedy base runner, Nunnally, running down the line. So Lieber. Faces Ricky Henderson with the bases empty and two men out here in the seventh inning. And Ricky pops it out of play and the count evens one and one. Tom Brenneman will join Bob Brenly in the top half of the eighth to take you the rest of the way here on Fox Sports Net. Our debut telecast. We'll have it from stem to stern for you here in the year 2000, the opener in Japan and the World 
Night Series on Fox. And we are delighted to be a part of this historic night in the land of the rising sun. The sun is rising in some of the locations where people are tuned in right now, I'm sure. Yes, it is. Quarter to eight Eastern time in the U.S. Three balls, one strike. And Ricky draws the two-out walk. Lieber has issued two free passes in the game now. And Daryl Hamilton is the batter. Well, friends, go to MajorLeagueBaseball.com for the most complete coverage of baseball on the Internet. MajorLeagueBaseball.com is the official site of Major League Baseball. Daryl Hamilton has the lone New York RBI tonight, a sacrifice fly that scored Ray Ordonez in the third. Also tapped back to the mound and grounded out to second. And he hits a high, soft fly ball to left. Tarek Brock charges in, puts it away, and the seventh inning comes to a close. John Lieber is cruising right along. They're cruising right along in the Tokyo subway as well. We may need to take that home tonight. 4 1 is our score. Tom Brenneman joins Bobby right after this. It's the official Mets 1999 highlight video. Hoffman set. The pitch to Piazza. Hit in the air at deep right field. That goes Quinn. Looking up. And it's out of here. The Mets win the ball game. Mike Piazza with a two-run opposite field home run off Trevor Hoffman. Be here Sunday, April 9th as the Mets battle the Dodgers. All adults 15 and over will get a free copy of the 1999 highlight video. For tickets, call 718-507-TIXX. Today's finalist for the Follow the Mets to Japan sweepstakes is Edwin Sunheim from Port Chester, New York. Edwin called 212-465-6171 before 5 p.m. tomorrow night. And you're a winner, courtesy of Japan Airlines, Hotel Nico Tokyo, The New York Post, WFAN, and Fox Sports Net. We're back in Tokyo. Youngsters rooting on the Cubs, others rooting on the Mets. And let's listen in on our Fox Sounds of the Game. Pitcher's in the two-hole. Rodriguez. Nunley stays in the game in the ninth spot. How's it going? Okay, buddy. How's Billy doing? All right. He's okay. Hanging around Denver. You don't remember from my legs, do you? Huh? Yeah, I remember we you. Back, yeah, man. you guys, we went way back. A little reminiscing there at home plate. John Stearns, the bench coach for Bobby Valentine and the Mets. And Randy Marsh, the outstanding longtime umpire in the National League, one of our good friends from way back, having a little conversation there reminiscing about their minor league days. Of course, the umpires in a very different situation this year. They formed a new group to represent them rather than Richie Phillips, a longtime head union man for the umps. And you see the four-man crew working tonight, and umpires this year will work in both leagues, not just those in the National or those in the American. Great to be back with you. Glad you're with us here on Fox Sports Net. We're in the eighth inning. A couple of changes for New York. John Nunley remains in the game. He plays center field, taking over for Daryl Hamilton. And now on the mound, the veteran left-hander, Rich Rodriguez. High ERA last year pitching for the Giants. He's another one of those rubber arm guys that will pitch whenever asked to go out there to the mound. And the Mets are very blessed to have a couple of tough lefties coming in out of that bullpen. Gives Bobby Valentine an opportunity to play the odds, play the percentages late in the ballgame. There reinforces what Bob was talking about. Rodriguez took the ball frequently for Dusty Baker and the Giants over the last three years. Eric Young breaks his bat and fouls it off down the left field line. Yeah, the white helmet there, you see the jersey says the big egg on the front, the helmet the same thing. I got to tell you, Tom, these gentlemen sitting down or ladies, whatever the case may be, the foul, the people working in the foul lines have made some tremendous plays, very athletic. We've been here in Tokyo the last couple of days. We've been able to watch some high school baseball on local television. Good-looking young players. That one fouled out of play. We saw some outstanding pitchers. Kids 16, 17, throwing 88, 91 miles per hour. They played professional baseball in this country going back to 1936. So they know the game and play the game well. They've seen a good one here tonight. 4-1 Cubs lead it in the eighth inning. And that one fouled off. It'll 
stay one and two to Eric Young. Well, you and I could talk for days on end just about our experiences here in the land of the rising sun. The cleanliness in this city is something that just overwhelms you upon arrival. A city that really joins two other cities with a population of close to 30 million. That one in the air to left field. Henderson waits and makes a catch. And granted, there are things about our culture in America that certainly could help their culture here. There are also many things about this culture that we could take back to America. Yeah, one thing that links the two cultures is the game of baseball. And that doesn't change no matter where you are. If you can hit, you can hit. <laughs> And you see the gentleman sitting there wearing the mask. Part of their culture here that if you're under the weather, if you have a cold, if you have the flu, whatever the case may be, it's proper etiquette in this society to not spread those germs to others. So as you walk around the streets in Tokyo, you'll see a number of people covering up their nose and their mouth. So if they sneeze and or cough or whatever the case may be, they're not polluting the air with those germs. It has nothing to do with garlic and lunch. Well, maybe in some cases, perhaps. <laughs> Buford takes down low. He's ahead two balls and no strikes. Terrific Cub debut for Damon Buford. He's been on base four times tonight. Two hits, two walks, is knocked in a run and scored a run. He had the first hit of this 2000 baseball season and with it the first run batted in back in the first inning against Mike Hampton. Now one thing that has been very odd and I think you'll agree with me is the the yen roughly a, a hundred yen to one American dollar and when you exchange your American currency when you get here to Tokyo and they hand you several hundred thousand yen depending on how much money you want to change that's a bizarre feeling to hold a 10,000 yen note two and two and to give you an idea of some of the prices there you see 230 yen and Bob go ahead and tell them About two what those are for 40 cents yeah no I mean the menu item that cost 800 yen there I think that the 800 yen, I believe, is uh, uh, sea bass. Sea bass sandwich. Yeah, sea bass. On the ground to third. Sure handed Ventura throws on for the second out of the inning. And to give you an idea of how expensive it really is, we complain about the recent rise in gas prices in America. Try on 370 per gallon here. Blue jeans. Oh, yeah, 90 bucks. A taxi to the airport. You think it's bad O'Hare, Kennedy, <laughs> LaGuardia? Nah. 250 bones for a two and a half hour ride. And the old continental breakfast. A cup of coffee, glass of juice, and some toast for 27 bones. Woo! <laughs> Glad I brought those Pop Tarts. Down and in, ball one to Mark Grace. Well, it is steep. Sosa and the Cubs with a 4-1 lead here in the season opener for Major League Baseball. Grace takes low and away. Two balls and no strikes. You know, it's funny. Many people have talked about this season and you discuss the various clubs. One team talked about often, obviously, Cincinnati, a central division rival of these Chicago Cubs. And when they talk about that dynamite Reds bullpen, they say, well, those guys have been overworked the last couple of years. Don't know if they can hold up as that one is chopped foul. I have never heard that question asked about the New York Mets bullpen. And they got into that bullpen as frequently, if not more frequently, than Jack McKeon had to in Cincinnati. I think perhaps the difference would be the Reds bullpen was a very young group a lot of rookies a lot of uh, second third year players whereas the Mets bullpen was comprised mainly of veterans who knew their roles they were plugged in 
knew exactly what they were going to be asked to do on a given night. I think that Reds bullpen was a little more volatile, a little, uh, you know, what, never really quite sure what they were going to bring to the table. Very talented young arms. But uh, guys like Rich Rodriguez this year, Dennis Cook last year, Kirk Wendell, these guys knew exactly what was expected of them. They could look ahead two innings on the scorecard and see exactly what hitter they were going to be asked to get out. When, you're, when you have that kind of a situation and you know how you're going to be used, I think even if you pitch every night or five days a week, uh, you're better prepared for your job. You don't waste pitches in the bullpen. Yeah, perhaps the young guys get up too early in the Reds bullpen. They throw too many pitches warming up to go to the game. And that is many times where the damage is done. Race puts a charge into one way back to right field. Whether it be the English language or in Japanese, it's all the same. Home run. Chicago. We heard Mark Grace talking about his approach to hitting earlier in the game. There are some situations you just go up there and look for a pitch to drive. Good extension through the ball. Great backspin. That ball seemed to carry forever. Lands about four rows up in those right field bleachers. And what do you think Sammy wants to do right now? Boy, there you see Mark Grace in contact. Those arms extended. Reaching out through that ball. That's what gives it that great backspin. And can he hit? You mentioned it earlier. More hits and more doubles than any player in the major leagues during the decade of the 1990s. Mark Grace. So Lieber now a four run cushion thanks to the long ball from Grace. to Sosa who's been aboard three times. You were talking about Robin Ventura earlier about a game. The same is true of Grace. Dawson immediately comes to mind. Gary Matthews, Ryan Sandberg, all these guys, he had taken the best things from their game, incorporated them into his game. 2-1 to Sosa. Rodriguez turns it loose. Hit hard, fair, down the left field line into the corner. Sosa makes a turn, and he cruises into second with a stand-up double. Fourth straight time, Sosa's reached base. Generally, it's the other way around. Sosa hit third and Grace hit fourth. Sosa hit would hit the long ball. Grace would double. Well, Don Baylor said he wanted to see Sammy get more involved, be a more complete player. He hasn't hit a long ball in this game, but comes up with his second base hit. He also has walked twice in the ball game. And who's the best cheerleader on that bench? He's rooting that ball fair all the way down the line. Gotta love a guy like Mark Grace. Well, you do. You really do. You and I are fortunate enough to be around him for a couple of years, day in and day out. He is a baseball player. Tarek Brock will bat for the first time. Showed you earlier making his major league debut here tonight. This is his first big league at bat. Fastball inside. You see a guy with a last name of Brock, and you think, well, is he related to Lou Brock? No, but he does have a famous cousin, former NFL quarterback and Super Bowl MVP Doug Williams, currently the head football coach at Grambling State University. at second two away here in the Chicago eighth inning and that one fouled off two balls and a strike to Brock so said grace they're expecting 
expected again to carry a large part of the load for this Chicago team offensively. It worked beautifully in 98 when they advanced to the playoffs. They did their part, but had very little help last season when they lost 95 games. pitch on the ground into right field a base hit they're gonna wave Sosa here comes a throw from Bell to the plate slide out at the plate so Gene Glenn waves Sosa with Bell charging in right field and he fires a strike to Piazza cutting down Sosa at home you get one more look Grace homers in the inning and we head for the bottom half of the eighth the Cubs beating the Mets five to one and Grace says hello to the new millennium with his first home run. year old native of Council Bluffs Iowa John Lieber an outstanding effort tonight seven innings allows only one run and he'll give way to the big right hander former number one pick of the Astros Brian Williams. Williams signed as a free agent from the Houston Astros pitched in 50 ball games for the Strohs last year recorded a two and one record a 441 ERA used to be an extremely hard thrower doesn't quite have the same fastball he had earlier in his career but still throws very hard tries to spot the ball in the corners mix in a little slider from time to time. Once again, this is another one of those situations where Don Baylor has an idea of where everybody fits on this roster. But Brian Williams coming in out of the bullpen here in the bottom of the eighth inning. An opportunity to play setup man. And if he does the job well, he may get another opportunity. He had an outstanding spring, and that's why he's been given this chance on opening night. He starts at Gardo Alfonso at two balls and no strikes. Williams only had one bad inning during the spring that inflated his ERA. But he really opened the eyes of Don Baylor. Oscar Acosta, the pitching coach, will come out and probably just try to settle Williams down a little bit. Yeah, certainly to be expected. You know, after leaving Arizona or Florida, whatever the case may be, very relaxed atmosphere. Pitchers running on the warning track during the game, guys signing autographs. A very casual atmosphere get your work in but have a good time all of a sudden you look up and it's opening day and it's time to start playing for real and it's natural that those butterflies will start working their way around your stomach a little bit close to the pitching coach out to have a quick word with the right hand 2 and 0 to Alfonso and he looks at a strike and Gardo doubled the left center in the first inning he has since struck out and reached on a throwing error by Andrews at third in the fifth inning be one of the hardest things for these two teams to be here in Japan playing this game opening the 2000 season trying to get the idea out of your mind that this is not an exhibition game this counts in the standings all the statistics are going to count for your bubblegum card next year but yet you're playing in a ballpark that uh, you've never been to before in front of fans that you've never seen before it's a very odd kind of a feeling here and there's ball four to Alfonso so he's aboard to begin the bottom half of the eight. Let's turn back the clock to that wonderful National League Championship Series. They were thinking game seven when Piazza shot one into right center field in the eighth inning off John Smoltz to give the Mets their first lead of the game and hopes of a game seven only to see Atlanta score the bottom of the inning to tie the bottom of the ninth to win it and advance on only to be swept four straight by the defending world champion New York Yankees see the numbers on Piazza his career in the postseason the Dodgers and the Mets it's one of the many things about Mike Piazza that makes him so dangerous tremendous power from foul line to foul line so take John Smoltz out to right center field and a Turner field in Atlanta we've seen him pull balls over the pavilion at Dodger Stadium no safe place when Mike Piazza is up at the plate if you're sitting in fair territory beyond the fence. High again from Williams, and it's two balls and a strike. A lot of thunder in this Mets lineup. They may be down four here in the eighth inning. 
but that can change in a hurry against a shaky real shaky Chicago bullpen. swing from Piazza Williams reached back a little bit that time 93 miles an hour on this fastball and this is in a zone that Piazza normally likes the ball middle of the plate in his eyes light up he just can't quite catch up a big swing from Piazza generates a lot of power with his upper body that was old fashioned hardball yes, right it there. Was. two two Came right back in there again. Don Baylor will tell you point blank. The bullpen could be a real key for this Cubs team this season. Runner goes. Piazza fires one in a deep right center field. to hit a home run. Oh, that ball was blasted. <laughs> Big Mets fan. Now Robin Ventura, it's a 5-3 Cubs lead. Boy, there's a very fine line between being brave and being foolish. Throwing Mike Piazza three consecutive fastballs over the heart of the plate, I would have to consider foolish. Williams misses high to Ventura. One ball and one strike. Piazza hit 40 of them a season ago. Number one in the year 2000 right there. That'll put a smile on all Mets fans' faces. Look at that little guy. Some players back in the States had said this wasn't a good idea. That face makes it worthwhile. <laughs> One hopper at Grace, and Ventura again slips coming out of the batter's box. He fell down coming out earlier and sort of limped off the field. That was back in the second inning. Well, the way Ventura reacted, I thought perhaps he had fouled that ball off of his front foot. But you can see once again, he just crumbles right there. The ball was hit fair down the first baseline. Grace made the play easily. Robin Ventura just never was able to gather himself and make any kind of a move out of the batter's box. Williams has good velocity on that fastball. However, very little movement is a tracer. That ball has absolutely no movement, and you just cannot rear back and throw 90 mile an hour fastballs down the heart of the plate if you're not going to have some kind of movement. You either have to work the corners or change speeds or find a way to get that ball to have a little wrinkle in it. That's entirely too straight. Fastball up and away to Bell. One ball and one strike. They have the wave going here at the Tokyo Dome. They call it the tsunami. Pardon me. Domo Arigato. Mr. Robato. <laughs> well, you can see the cuts that some of the Mets hitters are taking here against Brian Williams. It's all Mike Piazza challenged with three consecutive fastball. The third one ending up in the seats. Now Derek Bell up there. Whirly birding on a fastball down in the strike zone. Really surprised at this point that Joe Girardi hasn't forced Brian Williams to throw an off-speed pitch, throw a breaking ball, do something different. On a fastball, Grace a diving stab from his knees feeds Williams at the bag. Grace a home run in the top of the inning, and a defensive gem here in the bottom half. 
Leaves his feet to smother that ball. You see, he didn't field it cleanly, but he got some leather on it, knocked it down, had the presence of mind to throw from his knees on to Brian Williams covering first base. Okay, no pictures, just numbers as far as Mark Grace is concerned. Did he get your guy? I got it. I believe he's saying to his teammates, I caught it in my teeth. Four gold gloves at first base. J.T. Snow has come over the last couple of years since leaving the American League to take away that gold glove at first base for Grace, winning the last three seasons with the Giants. Todd Zeal hitless in his Mets debut. Good off-speed pitch there from Williams for a strike. Good-looking overhand curveball that time to Todd Zeal. Kind of froze him up there at the plate. The Mets hitters... Uh, forming a conga line to get up there and take their rips at that fastball. Off Williams' glove, ricochets to Young, and it throws in time. That'll end the inning. Piazza clubs a two-run home run, much to the delight of that young man. But right now, the Mets still trail. 5-3 as we move to the ninth in Tokyo. Welcome back to the Tokyo Dome in Tokyo, Japan. Tom Brenneman, Bob Brenly, Chip Carey, and our entire Fox Sports Net crew. Glad to have you with us. A couple of changes defensively for the Mets. They make a double switch. Matt Franco takes over for Todd Zeal at first base. And now on the mound, no relation. Left-hander John Franco. Long-time closer, major league left-handed closer. John Franco, you see his numbers from last season. He was... He lost his closer's job to Armando Benitez. Went down with an injury. Benitez came on, took the job away from John Franco. Well, we've had a great time thus far here in Tokyo. Of course, these games do count as Rick Aguilera begins to get loose. He's the Cubs closer. Two-run lead as we move to the ninth inning, and Bobby, we've seen a good ball game here tonight. Uh, I think everybody clearly feels the Mets are the superior team between these two ball clubs going into the year. But as the old adage goes, that's why you play the game. That's why you play the game, and I'm really uh, kind of surprised to see the intensity and. Uh uh, the way this game has been played so many times coming out of spring training as you get a look at where Franco ranks among active save leaders so many times coming out of spring training it takes a few games maybe a week maybe more for a team to get into regular season mode players are not used to going nine innings pitchers are used in a very uh, odd way in spring training sometimes you'll see the closers start the game so they get an opportunity to pitch against the opposition's best players they don't generally use the pitchers in the same manner they're going to use them in the regular season. If you're not familiar with John Franco, uh, his bread and butter pitch is a screwball. Throws a couple of different fastballs, but generally when his back's against the wall, he needs an out or he needs a strikeout. He'll turn that ball over, get it to fade away from the right-handed hitters. He'll throw it a couple of different speeds. One's a little harder than the other. There it was right there. Got Andrews out in front. Just barely cued it off the end of the bat. Franco has had just a marvelous career. We showed you the 416 saves. Second all time only to Lee Smith. Franco has 62 saves. Shy of reaching Lee Arthur Smith Sr. But the question becomes will he get the chance to close games again. He was 19 of 21 in save opportunities last year before injuring a tendon on the middle finger of his left throwing hand. Armando Benitez took over a dominant closer as Franco fans Andrews to begin the ninth inning. Look at that last pitch. Actually a screwball up high in the strike zone. That is danger zone for a pitcher to throw an off-speed pitch up around the letters, but that time he was able to put it in a spot Andrews just couldn't get to. Well, the book on Franco for years was don't swing the bat. Very rarely will he throw a strike. But that screwball is so tempting, the arm motion is so good, and the movement on the ball is so deceptive, hitters consistently chase bad pitches out of the strike zone. Franco, a product of Lafayette High School in Brooklyn. Yes, indeed, the same high school that 
It was also attended by Sandy Koufax, Ken Aspromani, and Mets president Fred Wilpon. You see the delivery of John Franco, very economical. Finishes on that stiff front leg. Not an overpowering pitcher by any stretch of the imagination. Franco, a pitcher that would really fit in right here in the Japanese major leagues. They have a lot of pitchers who throw submarine, sidearm, a lot of junk, a lot of breaking balls, the pitchers that we've seen the last couple of days. Franco certainly would fit that mold as a guy that's not overpowering, relies on finesse and hitting his spots and taking advantage of the hitter's aggressiveness. Franco pitching in his Mets club record 486th game. Three and one to Nieves, and he chases what would have been ball four. For whatever reason, the Baseball Writers Association of America continues to turn their cheek, if you will, on closers and being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. I mean, with a guy of the career that Franco has had, you say, well, future Hall of Famer. Well, there are a lot of other guys that are still waiting that were great closers. There's strike three, and he's fanned the first two he's faced here in the night. This guy can still pitch closer or not. I'd like to remind you again on April the 6th, don't miss the first edition of Baseball Thursday on Fox Sports Net. Tony Gwynn and the Padres take on these Mets, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Then the night cap. The Phillies take on the Arizona Diamondbacks, the defending Western Division champions. That starts at 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific on Fox Sports Net. Diamondbacks, a big blow yesterday. Their all-star slugging third baseman Matt Williams fouled a ball off his foot, broke the foot, and he'll miss at least the next seven, eight weeks. That's a tough loss uh, for any ball club to lose your cleanup hitter. Perennial gold glove defensive third baseman and a tremendous leader, Matt Williams. That's a... Uh, it's going to be a loss that's going to be tough to absorb for the Diamondbacks. Ball one to Joe Girardi. That one off of Franco. It'll go to Ordonez, but Girardi will reach safely. That'll be a base hit. hitter batting for Brian Williams who in an inning allows a hit a walk and two runs. There you see the change up slice screwball grip that John Franco has on the ball before going into his set position. Leniak one hopper back to Franco and that's that. So the Mets will bat in the bottom of the ninth inning. It'll be Ordonez, Nunley, Henderson to schedule trio. With Aguilera coming on from the bullpen. Originally a New York Met, 38 year old Rick Aguilera. Aguilera came to the Cubs last year from the Minnesota Twins when the Cubs closer Rod Beck was injured, got off to a horrendous start with the Chicago Cubs, helping them fall out of that Central Division race. He got very strong down the stretch, however, his overall numbers looked very good. But he'll probably be remembered most by Cub fans for failing when they needed him the most. It was a fastball in the mid to upper 80s, a very good fourth ball, an occasional slider. Really needs to have his excellent control to be effective. Let's take a look at our play of the game. It was a one-run game until the seventh inning. Shane Andrews got a pitch to his liking out over the plate. Our Nissan play of the game. Shane Andrews two-run home run over that right field wall here at the Tokyo Dome. Andrews, quite a debut for the year 2000. He joined the Cubs the last three weeks of 1999, but to kick off the new year. A big night. He's been on base four times. Jeff Houston takes over at shortstop. Placing Jose Nieves. This is something Don Baylor is going to have to do quite often. At least he hopes he has to do it quite often with a lead late in the ball game, make several defensive replacements. Bobby Valentine out to have a word with Randy Marsh. Not exactly sure what prompted this. Don Baylor 
are probably wondering the same thing. I think Tommy I talked to Randy Marsh in the hotel lobby yesterday and he said there are a couple of different things about playing here. One of them being there's a fifth umpire behind home plate. In the in America, when a, a change is made, the umpire turns around, looks up to the official score in the press box, points to the pinch hitter, points to the defensive changes, whatever the case may be, the announcement is made, the replacement becomes official. In Japan, you report to the umpire behind, behind home plate, who then calls up to the official score in the press box. Perhaps Bobby Valentine wasn't made aware of the changes that Don Baylor made defensively. And now Randy Marsh will come over and visit with Don Baylor. And while they're working out this, it takes a genius to get this whole situation right. Well, if you ever wondered what your sports IQ is, then be sure to check out Sports Geniuses. We're in the bottom of the ninth inning. Five runs, 12 hits, two errors, 13 left on base for Chicago. The Mets, three runs, six hits, no errors. They've left seven. Aguilera on to try and close this one out. And he delivers ball one down low to Ray Ordonia. Aguilera, 10 game winner for the Mets when they won the World Series back in 86. Then he was a starter. Was of course dealt to the Minnesota Twins in that blockbuster trade that brought Frank Viola from Minnesota to New York. And has been in Minnesota ever since, except for a short spell in Boston in 95. One and two on Ardonia. World Series rings, both with the Mets and the Twins. In the air, right center field, playable for Buford. One gone in the night. That's exactly what you want to do facing a guy like Ray Ordonez. Get him to hit the ball in the air to the big part of the ballpark. Ordonez is not one of those guys like a Mike Piazza who's going to drive the ball 450 feet to the opposite field. You get those little guys hitting the ball in the air to the big part of the park, you're going to be pretty successful. Boy, what a great outing by John Lieber tonight. Mm -hmm. Stepping up when the Cubs pitching staff was in disarray. Kerry Wood injured, Ishmael Valdez injured. injured. John Lieber steps up and pitches a tremendous game under a lot of pressure for new skipper Don Baylor. Don Baylor told us before the game he remembers when he was a player Al Kaline great Hall of Famer told him that the key on opening night is to get that first at bat hit one right back through the middle for a base hit and then it's time to get on with the season. We said well <laughs> what makes that analogous now as a manager you can't go up there and get the base hit he said get that first win. Baylor has a tough job. No two ways about it. The Cubs on paper don't stack up with other clubs in their division. Cincinnati, the three-time division champion Houston, St. Louis in that revamp starting rotation with Andy Bennis and Pat Hankin and Daryl Kyle. But it won't be from a lack of effort when that man right there is running the ship. Base hit into right field for Nunnally. So the Mets will send the tying run to the plate here in the bottom of the ninth. Well, Don Baylor was hoping it was going to be easy. Nunnally reaches base, which obviously brings the tying run to the plate. So you want to be a manager, huh? And Ricky Henderson is a guy that can hit the ball out of this ballpark. Henderson has seen more of Aguilera than any other player on the Mets team. Both Henderson and Aguilera spending the overwhelming majority of their careers, of course, in the American League. Well, Henderson has seen a lot of Aguilera, but he has not had a lot of success. Four for 22 lifetime. It's a 182 average. Henderson looks at a strike. Ricky one of three singled back in the third inning. He walked his last at bat in the seventh. That one almost hit him. <laughs> what a facial expression by Ricky Henderson. Always the showman. 
He talks to himself. He talks to his bat. Whatever it takes. 1 1 to Henderson. A check swing, and he fouled it off. One ball and two strikes. Lever's seven innings allowed, only five hits in one run. His third career opening day start, his first is a cup. Bob mentioned were it not for the injuries to Ismael Valdez and, of course, Kerry Wood, Lieber would never have gotten the ball in game one. He wouldn't even be in Japan. One, two. Fastball in the inside corner, strike three call. And the Mets are down to their final out. Well, they may have caught Ricky thinking too much with two strikes up there. That's a pretty good pitch on the inside part of the plate, middle of the thighs. Normally, Aguilera, when he gets to two strikes, will try to tempt the batter to chase a bad split finger out of the strike zone. Of course, as you mentioned, Tom, Ricky's seen a lot of him and perhaps got caught guessing there with two strikes. Now, Matt Franco. Terrific pinch hitter over the last few seasons with the Mets. Came on defensively in the ninth inning. Lieber and out away from winning the first game of the new millennium. And there's a strike to Franco. Clearly, this is a man Aguilera has to go after, knowing that Alfonso waits Piazza thereafter. Fastball, 90 miles an hour. He reached with that four seamer on the inside part of the plate. Bobby Valentine once again out to talk to Randy Marsh, the home plate umpire. that happened on that pitch. But Valentine came shooting out of that third base dugout right after that pitch was called a strike. It, it appeared that Randy Marsh was signaling with his hand the letter P, which would indicate that the game is being played under protest. Protest by the New York Mets manager Bobby Valentine with two away here in the ninth inning. And that's that. Under protest or not, what a way to begin the 2000 Major League Baseball season. The Cubs get outstanding starting pitching from Lieber. Aguilera takes care of things in the ninth. And the